The appointed hour of 6 p.m. having been reached, I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA Chair, I want to welcome everybody to this meeting. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access this meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Additionally, the meeting is recorded and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. We will begin with the roll call of ZBA members and panel for tonight's meeting. Steve Judge, I'm present. Ms. Parks? Here. Mr. Maxfield? Here. Mr. Meadows? Here. Mr. Gilbert? Here. Also attending on the public hearing tonight is Eric Cochran, an alternate member of the ZBA, Maureen Pollock, planner, and Dave Waskevitz, senior building inspector of the town. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. One of the most important elements of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw is Section 10.38. Specific findings from that section must be made for our decisions. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will be asked quite, will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their Zoom app. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address for the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold, hold public hearings where the information about the project and input from the public is gathered. This will be followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the application tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of a hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decisions. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there is a 20-day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, public hearing, ZBA FY 2022-11. Fearing Sunset LLC, represented by Thomas R. Reedy, requests a special permit to allow the construction of two apartment buildings, four duplex buildings, with a total of 17 residential units, including two affordable units, on approximately 2.04 acres of property. Under sections 3.01, 3.3211, 3.3214, 3.3217, Six point two nine, ten point three and eight of the zoning bylaw, located at one sixty four and one seventy four Sunset Avenue, Map eleven C, parcels nine and two ninety nine, General Residence R G and Neighborhood Residence R N zoning districts. After that, there'll be general public comment, and there'll be comment on there'll be other business not anticipated within for the last forty eight hours, and then we'll adjourn. The first order of business tonight is ZBA 
FY 2022-11 Fearing Sunset LLC. Are there any disclosures? I have one. I received an email. Um, when I opened the email, read the first sentence of the email, it was obvious to me that it was about this project. I stopped reading it, closed the email, returned, uh, had a response to the sender saying that, you know, I, I can't read this email. It's outside the scope of the, of the hearing. Um, sent that email on to staff to, for notice. I don't think it affects the way in which I'm going to decide this matter or, or I can still be dispassionate about an email I didn't read. Um, so that's my disclosure. Does anybody else have any disclosures? If not, um, we have um, a list of applicants submissions Mr. that I Chair? want to run through. Yes, Mr. Chair, I, perhaps uh, um, Mr. Meadows has has forgotten he wanted to uh, make a yes, disclosure. I'm sorry, no, it's okay. Uh, I should disclose that Barry Roberts, the uh, the owner of this property and developer, is also the landlord for my business in town. I submitted some information to Maureen and the town, the town clerk. clerck. Yes. Yeah. Yep. I don't think it will affect anything as far as my judgment's concerned. Any other disclosures? All right. Um, I want to review the applicant submissions. Um, we have a cover letter dated February 22nd, a special permit application, project narrative prepared by Bacon and Wilson, a management plan, additional information required for apartments. We have received a complaint response plan, a construction logistics plan, a timeline schedule, a traffic assessment prepared by Santec Consulting Services and dated February 25th, 2022, a copy of a residential lease agreement. We have a site plan sent, set prepared and stamped by Philip Henry of uh, Civil Design Group that includes I think 15 uh, or 13, excuse me, 13 uh, sheets. We have an L series of drawings stamped by Andrew Bone of Place Alliance dated February 18th that has six sheets. We have a building uh, uh, for building type A, one of the duplex units. Uh, we have a plan stamp prepared and stamped by Jonathan Salvon of Coon Riddle Architects dated March 5th, 2022 that has five sheets. We have a similar four sheet um, layout of um, type B units. There are four of those by Jonathan Salva of Coon Riddle dated March 5th. We've had a, um, I guess there is nine sheets on the B4 units, not four, nine sheets. We have for the type C units, uh, there are five of those units we have 11 sheets of, um, of uh, plans, again, prepared by Coon Riddle. We have rendered views prepared by Coon Riddle dated March 7th, model views, uh, temporary sign plan, stormwater management report, operational maintenance plan for residential development prepared by the civil divine design group, proposed fence types and images, and proposed findings from the applicants. We have no applicant waiver request from plan requirements. Is that correct? Okay, and we have staffs, the following staff submissions. Um, a project application report dated uh, April 27th, a draft project ap application report dated April 27th. We have a town of Amherst local district, historic district commission certificate of appropriateness dated December 21st, 2021. Comments from the police department, the planning board, the uh, fire department, the town engineer, the town uh, tree warden, and the Public Shade Tree committed, uh, Committee, all dated in various April dates. And we have one public comment submission by Connie Gillen. It's an email dated April 12th, 2022. We had a, a site visit on Mar Thursday, April 21st. I want to just review that briefly. All members of the um, sitting panel were at the site visit. Um, we looked at the, pre, the tree on the 
northwest corner that was proposed to be saved. We reviewed, reviewed the, the site plan on, on site. We heard plans to look, relocate the current houses. We observed the current sewer line that is proposed to be moved. We clarified that the total number of bedrooms in the project were 59. We walked the property, inquired about the elevation and fill required. We observed where new buildings were to be located and the common areas were to be located. We looked at the proposed fence line. We inquired about snow removal, inquired about marketing to uh, of the rental units to families and the cooperation with the university uh, to uh, encourage faculty and staff. We asked about how that cooperative um, uh, efforts were going to be pursued. We had questions about snow removal and we, inquested, we had inquiries about parking and driveways. Um, were there anything else that we talked about at that site visit that people want to raise and note here for the public meeting? Okay. And lastly, I want to announce my intention tonight for this, this hearing. I don't think it's going to be possible uh, for the application to fully cover um, But I do want to accomplish the following. I want to hear the applicant's presentation. I want to provide some time for board members to ask questions and seek clarification from the applicant. I want to provide sufficient opportunity for public comment and allow time for the applicant to respond to the public comment. And I want to allow board members time to raise any additional questions, seek additional information, and suggest possible conditions for consideration by the board at the next public hearing on this matter. Uh, so that's my my plan for this evening. Uh, once the we go into the uh, applicant's presentation, I, I hope board members will hold off on questions until the end of the presentation, unless. Uh, something needs to be clarified for you to understand the presentation, then please raise your hand. Marina or I will make sure to uh, let you get a clarification of a matter. But I think it just flows easier if we're, we have the whole, whole uh, presentation. Write down your questions and then we'll go through and give every member of the board more than sufficient time to ask questions of the applicant and to, uh, uh, to raise any questions and, or um, clarifications you need. And I'll make sure that everyone has enough time to do that. So are the questions from anybody on the board about our plans for tonight? Okay. If not, Mr. Reedy, are you presenting for the applicant? It's showtime, Mr. Chair. Yes. <laughs> All right. Well, um, <laughs> let's have your name and address. Sure, yeah. And then you may proceed. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. I'm Tom Reedy. I'm an attorney with Bacon Wilson uh, here in Amherst, here on behalf of Fearing Sunset uh, LLC, which is the applicant for the special permit, um, as the chair noted. With me this evening, we've got the whole crew. Um, so we've got uh, Barry Roberts, who's going to be the manager of the site. He's the manager of Fearing Sunset. Um, I think his, his reputation probably precedes him, as does his name. Uh, we've got Matt Leidner from Civil Design Group. He's uh, one of the civil engineers on this project. We've got Jonathan Salvon from Kuhn Riddle Architects, uh, the architect for the project. And then Andy Bone from Place Alliance. He's the landscape architect uh, for, the, for the project. And so we'll maybe just uh, um, drilling down a little bit, Mr. Chair, of, of our presentation. You know, I think what we'd like to do is talk a little bit about where we are, where we've been, and then where we expect to go. Um, site and stormwater, we're going to have Matt Leidner talk about, and then he'll turn it over to Andy Bone to talk about landscaping and lighting. We'll turn it over to Jonathan Salvon for architecture, and then and then back to yours truly for some traffic um, management and marketing. And so that's that's the, the presentation. I know that you had uh, asked the board to write down their questions. We're fine with that. If there are, you know, pressing issues, by all means, feel free to stop us and ask. But but we'll try to get through it, and we'll have we've got a a PowerPoint, um, and we also each of our professionals have their own design sets that I'll probably turn to to have them explain. Um, and so I guess you know with that, we'll uh, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. Let's see how I can do this, Maureen.
This is probably good enough. Okay, so so if you can see my screen, I, I don't know that I accomplished what I what I was going to to have all the other professionals share it. Uh, however, they have their presentations ready, so um, it'll probably be better for them to drive anyway. So first, I just want to give a little bit of site context. And so, hey, hey Tom, you're you're just sharing um, your desktop screen. It's not showing any sight like, lines. Do you guys like the photo that's there? It's beautiful. Thank you very much. All right, let, me, uh, let me try it again. How does this one look? Better? Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Andy. It's like you have something in your teeth and one of your friends tells you, so I appreciate it. Okay. Um, so just to orient everyone, the, the site um, is at the corner of uh, Fearing Street, Sunset Ave, and Amherst, part, part of the local historic Lincoln Sunset Local Historic District. So this, this project was conceived probably over a, a year ago. Um, we've had discussions with the town. We've gone through several iterations of the plan. Mr. Chair? It's, Mr. Judge, are you raising your hand? Am I doing something wrong? Maureen, do you want me to stop or keep going? Uh, yes, yeah, Steve, is, is everything okay? You, you uh, raised your hand. Uh, we can't hear you. Hmm. Should Tom proceed? Can you hear Tom? Oh, he lowers his. Uh, could you give us a thumbs up if you would like Tom to proceed or to? I mean, Maureen, for, for public hearing purposes, we obviously want to make sure that he can hear. Um, yep. Yeah, I don't I think don't, he can because yeah, he would put his like thumbs that. up or down. Hmm. OK, interesting. Uh, well, uh, please excuse this brief uh, moment. Let me try to figure this out. You can't hear. Uh, perhaps uh, my best advice for you, Steve, is to log out of the meeting and rejoin. And if that doesn't work, it might be you reboot your computer. Oh, he can't hear me. OK. Oh, smart. <laughs> and Maureen, I'm going to wait till he gets back just for Mullen's rule purposes, et cetera. Maureen, perhaps you give him a call. Well, um, for uh, anyone just joining us, uh, Steve Judge is having some technical difficulties, and we'll see if he can hear us now. I, He's smiling. I can hear you now. I can okay. hear you now. <laughs> well, perfect. Uh, the building can, uh, commissioner just showed up. I, I think we're ready to start the meeting now. And I was Tom, the only one that away. Could, And I was the only one that couldn't hear. I'm sorry. It's fine. Hey, okay, how's this? You can hear me. You can see the aerial of the screen. I got the whole thing. Thank okay, you. wonderful. Um, okay, where did we leave off? I just want to make sure you get the whole presentation, or uh, I'll just per perhaps start over again. I think that's yeah, probably I a good idea. Um, yeah, okay. I didn't hear any of it. 
<laughs> okay, so there's the introductions who everybody will be introduced as they yep. go along. So I'll save the balance of folks, uh, the agony of hearing that again. Um, and so I was just talking a little bit about uh, context and site orientation. So the site, the, the yellow box here is 174 Sunset. The blue box uh, just to the south of it is 164 Sunset. The project's location is at the corner of uh, Fearing and Sunset. As you see, this is a dashed line. The dashed line is because it's uh, actually UMass property. Um, so the town right of way stops at the westerly side of that intersection of the, the Sunset Ave intersection. It's also part of the uh, Lincoln Sunset Local Historic District. As part of this, we have to go through the Local Historic District Commission to receive what's called a Certificate of Appropriateness to make sure that the design, um, the architecture, the materials, et cetera, were um, appropriate for that Local Historic District. That's something, as you'll see in your packet, that, that we have done, we, we accomplished that. And you know, this project has, the, the property was acquired at the end of 2020. And so this project was conceived, I'd say shortly thereafter, maybe even a little bit before, thinking about uh, its location and the potential use um, for a residential redevelopment. It came in a, a, a previous iteration when we first went to the local historic district of a 17 unit townhouse um, layout. And so there was a, a couple of strings of townhouses along Sunset and then the whole back row was also townhouses. We had a, an above ground stormwater system, detention basin and no amenity space. And so the project that you're gonna see tonight has certainly evolved from that initial project and, and I'll give a lot of credit to the design team you know um, Andy Matt Phil who's uh, his civil design partner and Jonathan Salvon and Barry Roberts for the directive to make this fit into the neighborhood um, I'll, I'll make a point to say this these sites it's about two acres altogether has additional density and so if Barry really wanted to he could put additional units there but instead I think he's trying to be sensitive to this location as a transition between the higher density Southwest dorms and, and those uh, smaller lots properties to the Northeast of this property, you know, right over here. Um, and the single family homes, and there's some uh, duplexes, some larger fraternities, larger houses to the South. And I think he wants to respect the, the, the existence of these sites or this site at the end of it as a transition. And so the, the project you'll see tonight tries to embody that um, through, the, through the design. We've also been through the Shade Tree Committee. Um, and I think the upshot of that, uh, because there's a process and Shade Tree Committee made a suggestion, there was an objection. So then it goes to the town manager. The town manager then um, has to make a ruling. He has not done so yet. However, uh, Barry has offered to keep the tree on that northeasterly corner of the site, um, which I'll, I'll get to in a moment and maybe I'll get to right now. So this is just a, a close up. You see the southwest dorms just to the north of the site. This is the Amherst Creamery building to the east. You've got a, a rental property just to the south. All this backland here is actually owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. This is all owned by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Uh, and then you've got you know, several smaller, dense lots, uh, condominium, non owner occupied condominium here. And this is the tree that we're talking about. So you're standing in the middle of the intersection. Um, your, your back is to the Northeast. You've got fearing, the, uh, fearing to the right, which is the private way owned by the university and then sunset running to the South. So to get back to the public shade tree portion of it, this is the tree that um, hearing the neighbors talking with the, the town councilors for this precinct, uh, Mr. Roberts has said that, and, and with the tree warden, there is a way to um, keep the plans the way that they are, but to, to mitigate the impact on this tree by, no, no, I probably won't do it justice, but, but by adding certain fill, adding certain relief valves for the root system, um, because, the, you know, the site is going to be raised in this area. There's another tree here that's going to be coming down as a result of there's a, going to be a sewer line um, 
uh, upgrade. So the town, the DPW has asked for that upgrade. So as part of that, this tree here is going to come down. And so while we haven't got a firm, a firm letter from the town manager yet, it's our sense that you know this tree stays, this tree goes. So that's the second piece, not only local historic district, we've also been to the public shade tree committee. And then thirdly, we've been to the, the planning board. Um, and we thought it was a, a very good meeting. We got some suggestions. We had a great discussion with them. And I know that you have some of those suggestions or discussion points in your packet. And we're happy to address those uh, later on. Uh, I don't know that we need to go line by line, but we can certainly address it later on. So now a little bit about uh, the site. So obviously, we were in the middle of the fearing sunset intersection. This is looking south along sunset. You've got fearing to the right. Uh, that's private way. This is about the uh, property line. You've got a crosswalk here and crosswalk here. And then you've got, so this is 174 sunset with your back to the south looking northwest. You see you've got the uh, University of Massachusetts dormitories here. One of the things to note is that this house, we have to go through the historic commission here in town. We've submitted for a demolition application. We would be taking down this structure, but keeping this structure, there's a porch on the back that would be coming down. This structure would be relocated to uh, 46 Fearing Street, which is literally just down the road from here. So um, this structure is going to be staying in Amherst. It is currently a, a single family home, non-owner occupied. It has four tenants in it. A little further to the south is 164 Sunset. Uh, again, we've submitted a demolition application. Um, the, the breezeway and the garage will not be coming with us, but the, this house will be moving and it's likely to be moving over to Hadley. Um, and so both of these houses are going to be saved. It's also a non-owner occupied rental property, single family home. And then we've got one with your back towards uh, sunset. You've got 164, you can see 174 in the distance. And then you've got the Southwest dormitories above. So I'm not gonna steal too much of the thunder from the, the design team, but I do wanna show maybe three renderings. Um, this first one, this is of the proposal. And so it's an aerial view. You see the Southwest dormitories to your right or um, to the north of the site. You've got the creamery to the south and you've got a rental property uh, not occupied to the west. And what we're proposing are 17 units broken up into six buildings or duplexes. So we've got a duplex here, a duplex here, a duplex here, and a duplex here. And then you've got what's uh, considered under code as apartments. And so you'll have four units in this with a unit here, two units in the middle, and a unit here. And then you'll have five units, another apartment in this building. You have a unit, uh, so there'll be street entrances for one, two, three units. And then from the, the back, there are two flats, um, two, two bedroom flats that uh, just take up that lower level. As I'm sure Matt will talk to you about with the grading of the site, you know, I, I like to think of this as like three different tiers. So you've got, uh, as you'll see, uh, a sidewalk on, on uh, the, in the public way. You've got um, sidewalks going into each of these units. And then you, you drop down essentially a story to this next flat area here where you've got uh, entrances to these units. And then in the back here, there, there are full basements. So not to get too much ahead of myself to talk about use, occupancy, et cetera. This is intended to be a, a multifamily mixed occupant um, development. And so what we've done is we've had conversations with the University of Massachusetts, with their athletic department. Um, they endorse and what they're going to do is you know, they, can't, they can't enter into leases. It's the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, um, but they are going to include us on their website. They're gonna include it in the packet they, that they provide to new faculty. Because as you'll see through the floor plan and through kind of the balance of the presentation, we've designed this um, for mixed occupants, but, but primarily families. And so, you know, you've got 43 parking spaces in the middle here supporting um, all of the, the residential dwelling units. And then you've got, you know, this is the second tier. 
And then again, there's um, a grade change down to this back piece, which is an amenity area. And so the proposal is for community garden space, for a um, seating area, a shaded seating area, for a natural exploration area, and then for some open space. And I'll show you a view from the Northeast, you know, again, um, and the landscaping here is the, the landscaping that Andy will talk about in a little bit. And then we've got one more above a little bit from the Southwest. So you've got the amenity space in the back, community garden, gardens, natural exploration area. You can see that these units have backyards. Um, they've got fencing, they've got screening. Um, and then, you know, we'll get to a place where we're showing you the front yards of these units uh, at, at the front. So, you know, I, I think with that, before I take too much of other people's presentations, uh, I'll stop sharing. And Matt, what I'll do is I'll ask you if you want to, I've got the erosion in, um, or I got the demolition uh, plan. I've got the site plan. I've got the grading plan, the utility plan. If you want me to put those up, or if you want to drive, by all means, I'll let you, I'll let you go and, and drive. Uh, Tom, thank you. Good evening, board members. Matt Leiden with Civil Design Group. Tom, I'll take you up on the offer if you don't mind sharing that th those plans. Um, Matt, just give us your address. Just give us your address for the record. Absolutely. 21 High Street in North Andover, Massachusetts. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Tom, if you want to go to the site plan maybe first, that, that's probably the most appropriate. So, uh, I know we have a lot to go through tonight, uh, so I'll kind of just breeze through everything and, and happy in the end or along the way as appropriate to, uh, if you want to stop me, I'll, you know, answer any questions, uh, happy to do so. Um, so I'll just kind of dive right in here. So um, as Tom explained, 17 units, um, two acre roughly site, just over two acres. Uh, the, the units are contained within six uh, buildings. I, I think as Tom had mentioned, four of the buildings are duplex buildings, and then two of the buildings are uh, apartment buildings. Uh, there are two uh, full access driveways proposed, one on Sunset Avenue uh, and then the other on uh, Fearing Street and a total of 43 uh, parking spaces in the, the proposed parking lot. So as Tom had alluded to during the presentation, um, you know, I want to talk about the, the third dimension a little bit here, uh, which is the grading. Um, so the, the site as it exists today, it slopes from uh, east to west. So if Sunset Avenue is the high side of the site, and then the, the rear portion, which abuts the, the Commonwealth of Mass land, uh, is, is the low, the low uh, portion of the property. And um, so our, our challenge as, as civil engineers here in, in designing this was really to um, develop a layout that, that worked uh, to the extent possible in, in harmony with the land. Um, and so one of the, 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 the main um, aspects of that was to locate the, the, the parking lot vertically um, in, in a manner that um, worked with both the grade of Sunset Avenue and, and of Fearing Street. Um, and so optimizing the, the, the grade of that parking lot was really key uh, to this design and sort of the rest of the pieces kind of fell into place after that. Um, and so the sunset, you know, start, kind of starting at Sunset Avenue and working our way back, you know, as Tom had mentioned, it's sort of a three tier design here. So Sunset Avenue is um, the, the highest part, uh, the frontage is the highest part of the site. And uh, the driveway coming in from Sunset uh, uh, grades down into the site and the parking lot is, is at a lower uh, level from, uh, from Sunset. And uh, in order to, to make that work, the foundations of those buildings uh, closest to Sunset have been stepped down so that um, the, the parking lot side of those are uh, a walkout condition, if you will, with the basement. So. Um, you know, that, that's, that's one way that we were really able to take this development and, and bring it into harmony with, with the grades that existed out there. Um, and then the, the next uh, set of buildings there, um, toward, toward, you know, closer to the back of the site, um, again, the, the foundations drop down and the, and the grade drops to the back of those buildings back toward the, uh, the amenity area. So 
you know, all of this was done the, in the associated grading to try to, um, you know, work with this site uh, to the best that we could. And, uh, you know, we, we feel that we really, uh, you know, nailed that. We, we achieved it with this design. Uh, it really works well um, with the land. In terms of stormwater management, uh, as you would imagine, the stormwater system um, is proposed to the, to the rear of the, the second tier, uh, so back toward the amenity area. Uh, toward the toward the western, yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, toward the western edge of the site, um, the stormwater management system uh, is is designed to collect the stormwater from the developed area, the proposed developed area, um, and run it through a pretreatment system on its way back to the uh, the storm the management system behind the the units there. Uh, the pretreatment will will do just that. It'll pretreat the stormwater prior to going into what is proposed to be uh, a detention slash infiltration uh, system uh, with an overflow at the northwest corner of the site used in some storms with some minor overflow. Uh, but for the most part, the stormwater from from the develop the proposed developed area will be uh, infiltrated in that system. As you can see, it's got a, a large footprint, uh, which means uh, a lot of infiltration <laughs> uh, will be occurring. And um, that overflow is really just using the larger storms with some uh, minimal um, uh, overflow to that point. And that point of discharge of the overflow was intentionally uh, selected in that location as that uh, mimics the natural drainage pattern. So there's there's a sort of a, the site does slope um, east to west, but it, it does focus up toward that northwest corner in the existing addition. And so that's why we, we located that overflow from the system uh, up there. So it, it mimics the existing hydrology. Um, and in fact, it, it decreases uh, as is required, uh, the, the, the rate of runoff up at that, um, up at that corner. Uh, we did opt to go underground. I think as Tom has, has mentioned uh, earlier in the presentation, at one point we had considered an above ground system. Um, the underground system and, in the, in the, you know, so every site is unique. The challenges, the criteria uh, is unique. Um, and so on this particular site, going underground really in the end made sense. Um, from my standpoint as a civil engineer, I like underground because uh, particularly when it's relying on infiltration because that, that infiltration bed, so the interface between where the water sits in the system and, and the infiltration um, soils below it, uh, that, that does not get clogged up over time so where, where an open basin might do that. Um, so it's, it's, it's more protective and, and it maintains that infiltration capacity in, in the long run uh, better in my opinion. Uh, but also in this particular case on this site, it, it allowed for um, a larger uh, yard area behind those, those lower units uh, to the west, um, which allows for a uh, quite robust um, amenity program, as, as I believe Andy will be uh, di discussing uh, after me. So um with that you know i'm happy to answer any questions or or andy i think tom you said andy would be next uh, if, if you want to take it from there um yeah and great. maybe you know one of the things i, I want to point out is um you know, it's a it's a pretty thoughtful design you know and i'd like to point out like one particular area so you've got um trash enclosure over here um we do have a retaining wall because of what we have to do with the the um, elevations on site uh, to meet the necessary grades for you know, driveway, uh, ADA pathways, et cetera. And so one of the neat features is this area here so that there is an accessible path to this amenity space back here. And so there are two ways back there. One of them is this stairway. Um, the other one is actually a path you know, not serpentine, but it's effectively working the same way to make sure that, you know, folks have an accessible path to this community garden space and to this um, public shade or the, the uh, shaded area, uh, the shaded sitting area. So, you know, we can get into whatever detail that the board wants about the little pieces that, you know, we think really makes this development special, but that's one of the things that I know it came up during the planning board and we want to just make sure to touch on that, that there is you know, this whole site, we, we're, we're compliant with making sure that there's an accessible path 
where needed. Um, and, and we've got one actually going all the way back to the amenity space. Um, Andy, why don't I turn it over to you if you want to talk a little bit about um, the landscaping. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Andrew Bone. I'm a landscape architect and principal with Place Alliance um, here in Amherst, Massachusetts at 37 South Pleasant Street. Um, so as <clears throat> Matt and, and Tom have, have talked about, one of the things for the landscape point of view that we really wanted to um, make sure we were very conscious of was making sure that the landscape fit in with the surrounding context as well. So <clears throat> understanding that um, Sunset has um, some unique houses on it, um, it's got some interesting garden spaces, we wanted to kind of play that transition into the site design along Sunset. So we've created a streetscape setting along Sunset with some uh, with the sidewalk set back with a nice um, elegant tree lawn um, with some really large shade trees proposed kind of setting the stage and bringing that that context through in, in the, this transitional area. Um, we've also looked at creating a little bit of a garden space and some lawn space for each one of the units. So um, <clears throat> at the same time, providing kind of a, an open street um, to the um, to the front porches that are that Jonathan will talk about on um, on the <clears throat> on the units facing sunset. So um, you'll see these kind of little areas kind of carved out, um, just lawn spaces, some nice low landscaping. So it's you know when you're sitting down, you'll still be able to see over the top of it and um, you know wave to your neighbors and and really trying to create that kind of that complexity in there. So that's this rendering is representative of what we're trying to do there. Um, we're, we're proposing some simple gates at the entry points to um, each one of the units, but um, that's really intended to, to kind of show and delineate the demarcation from kind of the public sidewalk into someone's private garden space in the front of the units. Um, Tom, if you want to work back to the site plan, um, I'll work kind of from the sunset uh, into the parking area, um, and then into the back of um, into the back of the units and amenity spaces. So, as we move down into the site, as, um, as Matt talked about, is you know the the site is really broken into these terraces. So as you move from the sunset Ave side, you move down into the parking area, which is um, sunken into the site. Um, and the front, the second row of units, um, that's their front door. Um, so creating some nice garden space uh, for them on their front door. Um, but they have more room in the back, so we really looked at the opportunities to provide some nice backyard spaces for them. Um, <clears throat> the, the landscape areas around the parking lot, we're really trying to do as much as we can to reduce heat island. Um, so creating some large landscape areas for shade trees um, to really help kind of bring that down um, and help cool that area. Um, and then have some landscape and some small, small lawn areas um, off the back of the front row of units and also off the front of the second row of units if that, um, if that makes a lot of sense. So in between the units, we're really conscious of trying to think through how to landscape those areas since it's gonna be pretty, um, it's going to have a decent slope through there. Um, we didn't want to plug it all with um, with landscape, so we really tried to be careful about our tree placements so that any of the windows um, that are looking out from one unit to the next unit would provide some screening, but it still allows some openness um, and some, some separation in between the units uh, was really important for us. So as we move from the second row of units um, to the back of them, this is where we've, we've thought about you know, creating some outdoor spaces. And the screening that we're, we're proposing is really about side yard fence screening um, so that the back of the unit has a little bit of privacy um, from the unit next to it. Um, but all the plantings back here will be pr primarily really low growing shrubs and perennials. Um, that that whole space that you're seeing kind of adjacent to the units is where the subsurface stormwater infiltration is. So we're not we're not proposing any large um, large deep rooted plants in that area. 
this is a good rendering that shows kind of that accessible route back um, around the units to the um, to the trellis area. Um, just a simple um, a simple area for people to hang out. Um, you know, have their kids run around in the you know the natural exploration area. Um, a lot of those elements are similar to the. Um, some of the stuff that's been done at Kendra Park recently, um, and it's just hugely successful um, and gives gives a really nice space. So um, we're also proposing some community garden plots um, that really will help um, you know the the community that lives here have have an opportunity to to utilize their space and this landscape to its kind of highest and best use. And this is a lot of what we had heard um, in our conversations with UMass and some of the families. Um, that are coming to UMass and what they're looking for. So a lot of that that information is kind of played out in this site design. Um, Tom, was there anything I missed on the landscape, or should we jump into the lighting a little bit? I think uh, maybe just talk a little bit about. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Over here. Yeah, so, so as far as the screening of the internal parts of the site from fearing, um, we were proposing a five foot tall installed height um, arborvitae hedge um, along the edge of that retaining wall. Um, the arborvitaes that are proposed in there mature at height between 12 and 15 feet. Um, so they'll provide a decent amount of screening without getting excessively large um, and really trying to avoid getting too much into the, some of the existing trees that are, that are along fearing now. Um, yeah. So maybe now would be a good time to kind of jump into the landscape unless anybody has, or into the lighting, unless anybody has any questions about landscape before we jump through that. Okay, so the lighting is is a is something that we really, is an important part for what we do. And Tom always gives us a hard time, but, um, you know, it can really help set the tone. Um, you know, in New England, we have, um, we have a lot of dark early, um, early nights. So um, understanding how that can be, how, how that can be utilized and it really sets the tone. So we've, we've gone through and really thought through and selected a series of lights in, in a family ranging from um, low bollards um, to some sconce lighting that are be placed on the building to some more pedestrian scale, eight foot tall stuff, um, to some stuff that's a little bit bigger around the parking area to provide a little bit more um, capacity for uh, for lighting up that area. They're all LED, downcast, dark, dark sky compliant lighting. Uh, we worked with the lighting designer um, extensively to make sure that we're, you know, we're not bleeding off the property lines, um, but we're providing a nice, um, a nice ample lighting capacity. The, the amenity space does have uh, some proposed lighting. Um, right now we're, um, we're currently proposing them to be on a motion sensor. Um, but they could be utilized on a timer. Um, but we were thinking it made more sense, you know, to have it be something that turns on when people are back there and goes off when, when people aren't. But um, we'll work through that as we kind of move through that process a little bit. Um, I think that's it for the lighting. Tom, was there anything I missed on that or no, something you wanted to add? Just is there a chance of showing us some of the, while we're on lighting, can you show us some of the fixtures? You have some cut sheets of the, what the fixtures would look like. A little, blow it up a bit so we can see it better. Sure, so we have the sconce lighting um, just on the right hand side of the screen. You see the bollard lighting. Um, on the left side, that's the, the bollard lighting that's proposed in there. Um, and then we have um, a parking lot lighting on the top there, and then kind of a pedestrian scale, eight foot pole kind of streetscape lighting in that, in that condition. All downcast, all dark sky compliant. And we, you know, with the lighting too, it's one of those things that you know, we, it it needs. We want it to be there to provide the purpose, um, but we also don't want it to be like a main amenity, big clunky piece. Um, so it's something that we want to make sure does the job that it needs to do. It provides the safe, um, a safe lighting level, um, and fits into the landscape without feeling um, super clunky, I guess. 
Thank you. For my scientific terms. We can probably leave that and, and then head over to Jonathan if you want. Um, well, I've got, I could probably start with. Sure. This one, which gives some materials and some of the details. Yeah, uh, and if, if we need to I, later, we can always bring up some of the floor plans, but. Floor plans and the elevations, yeah. So as, as Tom kind of discussed uh, earlier, you know, we've been through a, a couple of. Um, Jonathan, I, I know we all know you, but we need for the record. Oh, I'm sorry. And, and sorry. <laughs> yeah. I just dived right in. Uh, Jonathan Savon uh, from Funeral Architects. I'm principal uh, at Funeral, um, and we're located at uh, 28 Amity Street in Amherst. Uh, so you, as that you're welcome. As uh, as Tom said, we've we've uh, you know been at this a little while, and there have been a, a number of um, kind of iterations of this project. Um, and in our feedback that we've had from from other bodies uh, before we came here tonight, um, one of the things we really heard, and which which we were very responsive to, I think it was something we we wanted to do at, as well, was fit this into the neighborhood. And so we we have tried to take the buildings and break them apart. Um, into uh, pieces that really have the same scale and some of the same character as, as uh, other homes in the neighborhood. Um, so at the top of the sheet there, that's sort of the, 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 what I'll call the street elevation along uh, sunset um, that shows what we call the, the type C unit there on the left, which is one of the apartment buildings. Um, and from this vantage point, it has uh, three, three units. And then, as Tom said, there's two flats that are literally tucked into the earth in the backside. And then adjacent to that are two of the um, uh, duplex units. There's a total of four altogether with two more in the back. Um, but the intent was very much to make the duplexes look like a, um, a, a single family home uh, and typical to the neighborhood and to have the apartment buildings look like some of the larger homes, not necessarily in style necessarily, but in form and in scale. Um, as some of the other uh, larger homes in the neighborhood. Um, and so we've tried to break the forms down. So for example, again, on that type C unit, which is the upper left, um, you know, we've played a little bit with the roof lines. We've, uh, each, each uh, uh, building has uh, porches and distinct entries uh, and, and trim and window details that are, are very typical. Another thing we heard very clearly from the uh, historic uh, commission was that um, what I shouldn't price that back half a step. When we first presented it, uh, the buildings were much lower to grade. Uh, while some of the units uh, will be fully accessible, other units uh, by code don't need to be. But we still had them fairly close to the ground. Um, and one of the feedbacks we had was that we were encouraged actually for the buildings that fronted um, sunset, where where we didn't have accessible units in the front. Um, to raise them up so that you have that typical kind of, uh, say, two feet, 18 inches between grade and, and the first floor level uh, that is more typical of a, say, a 19th or early 20th century, uh, you know, a wood frame house. Um, and then down on the other side is the sort of Fearing Street elevation. I should say that's kind of with the, um, this is highlighting the architecture. So it's, oops, Tom, you cut off part of the page. Oh, here. that. Yeah, I don't know what happened there. Uh oh. Um, it's I'm not showing right the dumpster because I was trying to highlight the uh, the um, the street facade, but we've uh, Tom gets that back up. Give me thirty seconds. <laughs> I'll do a little dance or something. Yeah, no, that's good. <laughs> Pay no attention. All right, I got it. Sorry about that. What a night. There we go. Okay, sorry. Thanks. And so that's that's the sort of side view, but without seeing the, the screening that you would get uh, with the the uh, site wall, the plantings, and the the fencing. Um, it's more to kind of illustrate the the architectural character from the side. That's oh, there we go. Thank you. Um, and a little closer up, just to to give you a better sense of the the architectural character of the proposed designs. You know, we really are trying to mimic. Uh, traditional New England forms and, and detailing um, with clabbered siding, probably some variance in, in clabber exposure, certainly some variance in color um, to, to, to let each building have a little bit of its own unique um, form while still having a kind of a cohesive language for the whole development. I think that's still an important thing so that it looks like 
a, a single development. Um, we're also likely to vary that, that window pattern. So this, this example has kind of a six over one light pattern in the windows, um, but other buildings are gonna be kind of a two over two, bit more Victorian look. Uh, again, the, the porches will by and large be kind of wood frame again to make them look like, uh, like a, a traditional home as opposed to a more apartment style kind of concrete pad that you might see outside of the, uh, the buildings. Well, there's a good view kind of into the into the site that also shows that that screening that we're going to get along fearing streets um but also it gives you a good sense of the uh that that character of porches um and doorways isn't just in the front it's carried through the the development into the uh, interior as well were there other things tom uh yeah, that... maybe maybe we want to show some floor plans mr chair if you if the i, I assume yeah. that the that'd be okay. yeah i think we should Jonathan, if you have those at the ready, by all means, you can let me let me try and see what kind of damage I cause here. Hopefully, this is unfortunately on the preview. It's hard for me to tell I have the right one, but I think I'm starting with the A unit. Oh, is everyone seeing something at least? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I'm going to start with the A unit. I'll do these alphabetically. These are the duplex units, and hopefully, you can see my cursor. The A units are these two along Fearing Street, and kind of book ending here at the back. Um, and I should say that both uh, Place Alliance and Kuhn Riddle use the same rendering software, but we're working in two different packages. And so uh, the design packages, so I don't have all of their plantings. So don't look at my images for the, the plantings or the gates. Um, this is more focused on, on the architecture, but this at least uh, allows us to kind of orient ourselves to which, which building type we're looking at. Um, I won't dwell on these. I'll go right to the floor plans. So the um, the duplex units are, are just that. They're two um, units side by side. Again, for the Fearing Street uh, uh, units, the Fearing Street would be here on this side. Um, and please let me know if you can't see my cursor, if I'm going too fast and jabbering away too fast and I don't see a hand up. But um, uh, so they each have their own distinct entries with an entry closet, uh, an open living dining kitchen space, uh, uh, a full bath here at this level. John, can I oh, stop yeah. you for just a second? You said sure. Faring, you, you said this was Faring Street. I'm sorry, not Faring, you Sunset. Sunset. It's Sunset, okay. Yes. Thank you. Or it would be pacing the parking lot if it's one of the rear ones. Thank right. you. And Jonathan, could you zoom in? Oh, sure. Oop, that, that was not zooming, that was something else. Let me see if I can pan then. There we go. Try to get a little bit tighter here. Are folks seeing the, the whole floor plan at least, if not all the kind of dimensional text and whatnot, hopefully? Yep. Okay, so uh, again, an entry, entry closet, kind of an open living, dining kitchen space, uh, full bath at this level, some storage space. Um, both units, uh, um, the, actually all the duplexes, whether they're on um, sunset or facing onto the parking, uh, have a back stair that goes down into the basement level. And then on the sunset side, those exit out back onto the parking. Um, and on the interior ones, they enter out into the, um, the little garden spaces and, and the amenity space beyond. And I'll quickly kind of pan this over uh, down at that basement level, that's where that stair comes down. There's a small sort of mudroom uh, laundry space at this level as well. I'm going to move now to the hard move while I I'm just going to put that on the sidebar there to move up to the uh, second floor. Uh, the duplexes are four, uh, four bedroom units. Um, so the, the stair comes up to a central hall. Uh, there's, uh, uh, again, another full bath, linen closet. This is the large bedroom um, with a walk-in closet. Uh, then there are three smaller bedrooms uh, kind of around it. And it's, it's very similar in both units. They're, they're, uh, even though the entries are different, the, the floor plans are, are fairly much the same. Um, these will not read quite as well as the, uh, the colored elevations, but um, at least you'll get to see them a little bit bigger. Again, this is that front porch, either facing a sunset or facing the parking. Um, 
then this kind of illustrates down the right side, uh, the amount of grade uh, that we have to make up. Obviously there's gonna be a little bit of variance because it does kind of move a little bit, but uh, this is a good average um, illustration of, of the typical kind of drop off. My rear elevation, there's the rear elevation with those two uh, rear entries that, that uh, go out either onto the parking or towards the amenity space. And again, then the, the left side view. I'm gonna move to building B, unless uh, someone has a, a specific question. So building B is the apartment unit in the middle in the back. Um, as Tom had alluded, we've got two, uh, two, you know, two floor units, uh, very similar to the duplex units, kind of bookending uh, two flat units in between. And the first floor unit will be ex fully accessible. Um, let's skip through the accessibility details. Whoops, not too far. Um, and I'll come back to the basement if it's very similar to the, the B type units, but uh, at the entry point, so this is the parking lot would be up here where my cursor is. Uh, the entry to the two end units are very similar to the, the duplexes. Um, there is a common kind of entry vestibule for the uh, two flat units, uh, one, then, then you go one way and up a stair to the upper flat, uh, and then you go directly into uh, the, the first floor flat, the accessible flat. And there is a common stair that could take you back down and out the back towards the amenity space. And so if I go back up the page, uh, you can see how these stairs come down and out. The, the basement space for the flats isn't, really, isn't a developed space. Oop, wrong way. Second floor, uh, the two end units are very similar to the, the duplexes with four bedrooms, a larger bedroom here with a walk-in closet, full bath, three smaller bedrooms. Uh, and then the flat on the upper level is similar to the flat on the, the first floor level with uh, open living dining kitchen space and two uh, uh, bedrooms at the rear uh, with, a, with a, a bathroom and a laundry space. <coughs> Pardon me. I think, there we go. Uh, this is the elevation at the parking lot side. So there's the entry to one of the two uh, two floor units. There's the other one. That's the common entry into the <clears throat> into the flats. And now that I'm halfway into my <laughs> my presentation, I'm, I'm going to need to, to pause for a second and get some water because I've got a tickle. So I, I apologize. I will pause and be right back. So my apologies. <clears throat> Jonathan, you're you're. I think you're muted if you're talking. Oh dear, no, that's so now you're fine. Okay. <laughs> um, the right side view again showing that kind of gray drop off. The rear with those uh, entry or exit points towards the gardens and the amenity space, and then the left side view. I think that's it for this building. Building C, again, is that second apartment building here in the southeast corner on Sunset. And so here I am going to actually start in the basement. We have two flat units uh, with two bedrooms each, uh, an open living uh, dining kitchen space, restroom or bathroom, laundry facility. Again, these two units, because they are at grade, could be fully accessible. And so I'm showing them in a fully accessible uh, configuration off a, a common uh, entry hall 
Um, we could also enter directly into the units um, as well. There's a couple of different ways to access these unit types. Where's the front door on that unit? What does it face? It fa the, face the, the flats face the parking lot. Yes. The parking lot. Yeah. Because they're down uh, here. If you'll bear with me a moment, I'm just going to kind of spin ahead to the side elevations. I think it's a little easier to see. Um, so here on the side, you know, this is the uh, sunsets here, the parking lots here. These units are kind of entered at this level below the units that are above. And so I'll, I'll return to that again. But, um, you know, this is, this is the first floor for the units on the, uh, the sunset side of the building. And so they're entered from that you know, from the sidewalk uh, that we're, that we're uh, proposing along Sunset. Uh, and as with the, uh, the uh, B units or the B building, um, the, the end units are uh, very similar uh, kind of two floor units. But in this case, since our flats are below all of these units, we have a third uh, two-story unit in the middle. Uh, or two-story, <laughs> yes, a, a third two-story unit in the middle. These two units, the, the leftmost in the middle are four bedroom, and the one at the far right here is a three bedroom. So we go up to the next floor. Um, again, we've got a large bedroom with three smaller bedrooms around it. Uh, and then uh, in this center unit, the, the large bedroom is actually here with a different kind of uh, multiple uh, closet configuration with smaller uh, bedrooms around it. And then the three bedroom unit has the large bedroom in the front with a nice walk-in closets, uh, bathroom and two bedrooms at the rear towards the parking lot side. So again, this is the front elevation or what I should say more clearly as the sunset elevation, the three entry points for the two-story units uh, this shows the gray drop off. We're going to have to have uh, a retaining wall of some sort uh, to uh, gain us some light access for, for the, the, the second bedroom um, of the flats that are at the lowest level. And then, whoops, not too fast. Uh, at this parking lot side, that's that common entry. Um, all these, this portion of the elevation are the upper uh, two story units. These windows are all associated with the flat units. Um, you know, these look into the, uh, the open living, dining, eating area or uh, kitchen areas. That's one of the bedrooms. That's another one of the bedrooms. And again, you can see the, the, the site wall that we will need uh, on the, the left side as well. And just details, construction details. Um, anything, Tom, that I, else I should hit? No, I don't, I don't think so. I'm okay. sure there'll be questions so we can come back to it. Nice job. Yes, I'll stop sharing. Great. Um, and then maybe I'll, you know, I'll talk a little bit about traffic. So uh, we had Rick Bryant, uh, who's an Amherst resident from Stantec, put together the traffic uh, memo. Um, residential, as you likely know, is a pretty low impact use. It's, it's not like a commercial space where you've got people coming and going all day. You know, um, through the IT Institute, Institute of Transportation Engineers, this is supposed to generate 124 vehicle trips per day. Uh, at that fearing sunset intersection, uh, it's a 0.5% increase. So a, a really minimal increase. I think you're going to see an additional nine vehicle trips in the, the peak hour in the morning and 12 vehicle trips in the peak hour in the afternoon. So, you know, something that's not uh, going to impact the surrounding roadway network. Um, you know, as we've mentioned, there's, maybe I'll just bring this up so you can, you, know, you can look at a nice picture while I talk. Um, 43 parking spaces. So there's, there's 34, uh, 17 units uh, requiring 34 parking spaces and then there's three ADA spaces. And so you've got 37 spaces there. So there are six spaces that, that we'd like to use for, for visitor parking. We think having that, that amount of parking, you know, we wanna be sensitive to no street parking, right? There's, there's parking here on the UMass side, which are metered, but um, the point of this is to make sure that there's sufficient parking on site for 
um, the occupants primarily, and then guests as well. There's also a nice loading area over here. So I'm thinking Amazon deliveries, uh, furniture deliveries, you know, Peapod, what have you, Whole Foods deliveries can use this area over here. Um, we've got of those 43 spaces. So like I said, there's three ADA spaces. There are 18 uh, compact spaces. And then there are 22 in, in our compact spaces. They're just a foot uh, less than in width than a full size space. So a full size space is nine by 18. We have 22 of those. And then we have 18, eight by 18. So a, a true compact space can be eight by 16. Uh, so it would be two feet shorter, one foot less in width, but we're, we're saying still the same length, but just the width will be a little bit less, but those are still considered compact spaces. So that's what we have for the 43 spaces, 34 for the unit six um, for, for visitors. Um, and then, you know, a little bit about, you know, I mentioned before, this is a mixed occupant um, development. And so, you know, it starts with location and then it's, it's really through design. And, you know, there used to be a, a, a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals who wanted, you know, physical infrastructure that, that helped to inform use. And, you know, maybe I've been around too long, but we, we kind of took that to heart in our discussions here. So we've got, you know, the amenity space, the community gardens, the natural exploration area. Um, we've got those defensible spaces in the front of the units. We've got yard spaces in the back of the units. Um, the entire site design, uh, plus, and I, we haven't shown finishes. We can show you finishes next time if you're interested in it. it they're going to be very similar to what Barry has done at 70 University Drive and at uni one University Drive South with the type of counters, uh, the level of finishes that you're going to get here are, are higher end. So, you know, it's all of that plus the floor plan, you know, providing uh, the differentiation of bedroom, we don't have bed bath parity, so we don't have four bedroom, four bath, two bedroom, two bath, we've got four bedroom, uh, two bath, we've got two bedroom, one bath, and we've got three bedroom, two bath, you know, so it's the bed bath parity, it's, it's consideration of COVID, and like most of us, we're, we're working from home, you know, we're home right now, some of us are in the office, but, but many people are working from home, so it's allowing the space for professionals to be able to have a, a den or a library or just a space to, to, to have their work if they're working from home. And so, you know, all of that thought went into it. And then next is marketing and advertisement. So not only do you have location and then design, but then you have marketing and advertisement. And you know, Barry's already reached out to the folks at UMass and UMass Athletics. We've talked to them because they have they have two websites, right? They have an undergraduate website where you can post and people will go, um, and that's for undergraduate housing. And then they have a faculty and staff website, and and that's what Barry has been talking to them about. And like I said, they can't enter into to leases to actually lease these, but there's they've been incredibly supportive and very interested. And I think it's a frankly a huge uh, benefit to their recruitment of the best and brightest to come over uh, and, and work for the university. So it's it's thinking about you know, who are you marketing to and, and that also is informed by design. And then it's tenant selection. And you know if you, you look at 70 University Drive as an, as an example, you, know, you don't hear about that property. Um, Barry does a good job at, at managing and but selecting who's going to be occupying. And, and this is one of those developments that you look to get the right folks in initially, and then it self-regulates to a certain extent. You know, you don't allow it to become uh, an undergraduate place. Um, it's not good for, I mean, it's a headache for management. It's not good for the investment that you've made on the property. And it's frankly poor reputationally. And it's something, you know, Barry obviously prides himself on his reputation. And then after tenant selection, it comes down to lease and lease terms. It's, it's, and if you've looked at our lease, you know, we've got a pretty restrictive lease there. They folks can't do much where they wouldn't get um, the, the potential for an eviction. And so it's it's setting expectations for those tenants. And then it's also following through because then you know, folks will know um, you're, you're serious. As far as the management of the property, we provided the management plan. We, we talked about, you know, the, the dumpster area. 
um, USA Waste is going to be in, in charge of that. Barry will be the, the contact person. Um, there are snow storage areas on site here. We've got some down here in each of these islands. If it gets to be where it, it can't be safely pushed, whether it impedes sight lines um, or we just had too much snow, then we'll chuck it off site and we're happy to accept that as a condition. You know, there's there's a robust landscaping plan here, and so it, it will be through local subcontractors to uh, work on the weekly mowing, uh, the weeding, the upkeep, the maintenance. And one of the things I think a little out of sequence that I would like to mention is we're, we're providing um, at, at the town's suggestion, I think it's an excellent recommendation, uh, a water line back here. So there'll be a spigot, um, I think it's called a yard hydrant, where folks... Uh, who they have their, their shovels, their rakes, um, their water containers, they can fill it up here and then they can go to their plot and um, be able to, to get the water from this right here instead of schlepping it from their, their unit. Um, you know, so we're providing that there's a lot of upkeep and maintenance, uh, but we're also, you know, it's, we'll have a local subcontractor responsible for that. We talked about the lighting and, you know, I think a uh, board in your packets, you should have, or at least accessible electronically, all of these renderings that we're showing. Because these renderings, if you'll see, I mean, so Andy Bone um, was the, he, his group put this together. You can see the taller light posts here. You can see the smaller, more pedestrian light posts there. I'm sure I can get to the, you know, I can show this where you see the amenity space, pedestrian scale light posts. Um, and let me see. And then you've got, you know, more pedestrian scale light posts, you know, in, in these areas here. So you can really go through and see the lighting all downcast. Uh, we've also submitted our sign plan. Uh, there's no name for this development yet. Um, you know, given how it is laid out, I don't know that there will be. Um, these may have, and we'll have to talk to the building commissioner, just individual unit numbers on them and, and be designated as Sunset Ave, you know, we can talk to the fire department of how, you know, how that will uh, work out. Um, let me think of what else we should touch on here. Uh, surveillance cameras. So there will be surveillance cameras on the property. It's part of the lease. It lets everybody know, um, no, none in the unit, but in the exterior of the property, um, just to make sure that it's preventative, uh, but it also allows if something happens, whether it's a stolen package or an accident in the parking lot or somebody knocking on the door that you would prefer doesn't, you know, we have the ability, we've got the surveillance cameras. Those are at 70 University Drive. They've come in useful. Uh, Barry can probably tell you for, you know, not that there's been incidences, but as far as, you know, packages purportedly getting delivered, but not getting delivered or somebody saying they haven't got delivered. So the surveillance camera is a nice, um, it's a nice feature. Uh, let me see what else. We talked about snow. We talked about landscaping, trash and recycling, parking. We've talked about um, we, you know, overall. I think just maybe simply put, there's there's four proposed two bedroom dwelling units. There's one proposed three bedroom dwelling units, and there's twelve proposed four bedroom dwelling units. Um, two, so that's 17 units altogether. 15 of the units are proposed to be market rate unit units. Two of the units are proposed to be affordable units. Uh, and what we've said in our narrative as Barry's done on the seven university drive project and what he's doing at one university drive South is while you're allowed to charge 30% of 80% of the area median income, he goes lower than that. Um, I think it's probably, I think it's called the voucher program. And so it really opens up these affordable units to more folks. We've chosen the two bedroom units for that because you know we've talked to wayfinders. We're going through the process currently for one university drive south, talking with DHCD, talking with other uh, affordable housing developers. And the two bedroom units are probably the most in demand of, of all the unit types. So that's why we've chosen those to have the designation um, as the affordable units. Um, you know, I think I'll, I'll go back to the beginning as I get to the end and I'll just talk about kind of the sighting of it again, you know, Southwest storms to the North commercial to the East, you've got quite a bit of density. And even if I go back, 
you know, to this plan here, quite a bit of density here, uh, rental here. And, and you know, we believe that with the proposed design, um, the spacing, you know, with the help of the local historic district commission, with the amenities, with the defensible spaces in the front, with the um, enclosures in the back, with the yard spaces in the back, with the, the separation from UMass by this, there's a four foot high wrought iron fence on top of the retaining wall, which is screened by the arborvitaes. You know, you've got a nice transitional space from this higher density area down to the lower density area to the south. Um, folks have asked, are you going to sell these units? And the answer is no, because it's much easier to manage. You know, even compared to what's there today, you've got two single family homes. Barry will tell you, this is going to be easier to manage than two single family homes because um, there's a more finite space, there's more defined spaces, you're going to have higher finishes, um, you're going to have uh, stronger leases, and it's going to be self-regulated to a certain extent, extent and, and that's where the effort comes in to find the right tenants for these spaces. So I know we've gone on for quite a bit of time, there's, there's you know, a bunch of nuances to get into if the board wants, but with that, you know, we'll, we'll be quiet and listen to any questions that you may have. Great. Thank you very much, guys. Um, I'll just start out with a couple of questions and then I'll open it up to other board members uh, and we can circle around with as many um, rounds of questions as we want and or as we need. Um, can we pull up the parking lot um, stormwater drainage slide that you that we had earlier, which there it is. So Talk to me about how that water is collected. Is that is the parking lot sort of V-shaped to funnel it into that dotted line, which is, I guess, a drain that goes back out? Or uh, and how do we prevent, and how have you engineered this to prevent flooding of uh, units, particularly the uh, back units on the, that are facing the parking lot? And Matt, um, let me get to let me let me get to a better plan just so I can zoom in even more because I, I think the chair would like some some nice detail with this. So let me get into one of your plans here. Okay. Do you want the grading plan or do you want the utility plan? I, I, I wouldn't know that. I don't know the difference between the two, but grading, what is this that plan, I'm looking Tom. at? Okay. Grading plan, Tom. This is the, so this is the grading plan. Okay. All right, Tom, so, if I may. Yep. Uh, thank you. So uh, that's a great question. So we talked at length about how the site is sloped, uh, you know, toward the, from east to west toward the back. However, that parking lot, as I had mentioned, that that was kind of the critical factor in the let you know grading the whole site, and so those units in the rear, which are you know the lower units on the site, they still have been designed such that the fronts of those units, so facing east toward the parking lot, have positive pitch away from the units to the parking lot. Um, and then the, uh, as you can see with the contours where they V at, at, along the western edge of the drive aisle, um, and that's where the stormwater trunk line is. So there's, there's catch basins on site that collect that water, uh, which is, is um, focused to that, that swale along the, the western side of the drive aisle. The water's collected there and then routed back through the, the um, treatment unit, pre-treatment unit, and then back into the uh, infiltration system. So uh, while well, the, the site generally does slope from east to west, um, you know, if you took more of a micro look at the topography and the grading, there is positive pitch toward uh, the east from the fronts of those units to, to that drainage system to collect the water, thereby preventing any flooding uh, of, of or inundation of those units with uh, water. Thank you. So the, the round circles at the uh, right there that's the that, that's the uh, basin that collects the water and then it goes into an underground pipe is that correct so, so where the cursor is right now that's a catch basin that's collecting yep. water 
the round circle that uh, in front of the middle of building five, which I think is what you had just mentioned, that's actually just yep. a main manhole. Um, and but then the next structure uh, to the north, uh, so go north to the right, right there. That's another catch basin to collect water. There's also two catch basins on the entrance coming down from Sunset Street to collect that water uh, that's flowing down that driveway. So uh, you know all these catch bases are located at low points uh, that have very deliberately been designed and, and graded in the parking lot to collect that water and get it to that system in the back. And, and I, Mr. I Chair, if you, if you look at the, and you might not be able to see it here, and I'll try to zoom in a little more, there are, there are small arrows, right? So yep. you can see the flow of the water. And so I would call this, you know, potentially a ridge line right here. And so this water is flowing this way towards this catch basin. This water is flowing this way towards this catch basin. And then they get into that drain line. And that drain line then flows towards the north. To this, there's a drainage manhole, and then that flows towards the west, towards this subsurface infiltration system. And if you look, you know, you've got top of curb here at 236, you've got top of curb here at 234, and then you've got the steps at 235 and first floor elevation at 238. So just as you're thinking about where the parking lot is in relation to those, you know, the first floor of the rear units, there's it's not all going to flow, and there is there's curbing back here. And mm -hmm. not to steal any of Matt's thunder, but I've been around him and him and Phil for so long. You know, they they purposefully designed the site. You can see the existing conditions underneath. So you know, two thirty three elevation, two thirty two elevation, two thirty one elevation, and then you see here, you know, you've got two thirty seven, and then you can see the the water will. I was pointing starts to go south because you've got a two thirty six, two thirty five to get to this two thirty four, and then same thing here, two thirty seven. 236, 235, 234. So what they do is shape the land mm -hmm. so that when the water sheet flows, it flows to those catch basins when it's then collected, treated, and then sent back to that subsurface infiltration system. And so my, my last question, that makes sense to me, thanks. My last question regarding this is that you must have sort of a two, five, 25 or 100 year um, rain that you model this for not only for making sure that this all, this shaping works and gets rid of the water but also that for the the um, infiltration in the back that it doesn't just lead to a swampy mess back there after a rain so can you talk to me about what you know what is the assumption you know i don't know about how how many year rain event do you look at to to model this because you could have something that you can't handle obviously but but um what's the modeling for that I could address that. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, great question. So um, part of the submission package to the board, I believe, was a comprehensive stormwater report uh, that goes through various design storms and um, shows the modeling of the collection system as well as that infiltration system and, and what happens for the various storms. So we modeled the two-year storm, the 10-year storm, and the 100-year storm. Uh, which is what is required uh, by the state in terms of stormwater design. And that report uh, provides the uh, comparison of the existing condition uh, runoff versus the post-development condition runoff for each of those storms. Uh, and for each of those storms, the water, the runoff is uh, not only treated, but also the, the runoff rate is mitigated for each of those storms. Um, and in terms of the infiltration system itself, uh, you can see there's um, sort of a checkerboard um, symbol mm -hmm. on the, uh, the right there, and then there's one in the middle there, um, and then one on yep, one on the northern end. So those were test pits that were that were done in that ex those exact locations um, again, which is required as part of a typical stormwater design. Uh, to evaluate the soils that directly underlie the proposed system. And in this case, uh, based on the soil textures that were observed in those test pits, uh, the applicable uh, infiltration rate, uh, which is a, a very conservative rate, um, was assumed for, for the infiltration capacity of that system. And that's all 
uh, documented in the stormwater report, both in the, the narrative portion and the, uh, the modeling output that's included in the appendices uh, of that report. So if there's any specific questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer, but that's kind of an overview of how we um, handle the, the, the stormwater management component of the project. And, and Mr. So, Chair, I know the town engineer looked at it. He gave his, he said it, it, thumbs it up, used yeah. to work. And then he said, and Matt, I don't know if you want to talk just briefly about TSS because town engineer said it also, it's, um, it, it achieves the required TSS removal rates for the new impervious surface. Sure. So TSS, total suspended solids, that's one of the stormwater standards that's required by the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, one of the several stormwater standards, you know, we talked about um, the, the mitigating the rate, uh, but but TSS uh, removal is is also one of the requirements. And so the the system here has been designed, um, as I've said a couple of times now, to pre-treat the stormwater runoff and then infiltrate it. Um, and that what we call a treatment train. So it's a you know, series of treatment devices um, that that work in series. Um, to provide uh, and, and, and um, knock down the, the total suspended solids loading from the development site. So the combination of the, um, the pretreatment device, uh, which is a water quality unit up in the, the sort of the northwest corner there before it enters the infiltration system, uh, and then the infiltration itself uh, provides the, the requisite tr TSS treatment before, um, before the infiltration. I'm not just trying to um, exp expand my knowledge of stormwater management, but I think it's really key that in order to maintain the um, kind of and to attract the kind of tenants you want, the amenities have to be uh, really well thought out and have to be high class in order to to achieve what is the goal stated goal of the, of the property. And so my interest in this case is that I want to make sure that the that there, it's all engineered right, so that you're not looking at flooding in units, or which would uh, diminish, I think, the attractiveness. But also that the the um, infiltration area remains, the ground above the infiltration area remains dry enough so that it can be used as an attractive amenity uh, in the future. And because if it's just a, a messy pit, which I know you're not uh, providing that, but now you've told me how, um, I don't, it wouldn't attract uh, quality, the, the type of clients and tenants that you want to attract. So that, that was the reason for my question, not just to become an expert on stormwater management. And is that in the management plan that the stormwater marine, or I, I didn't read that, I'm sorry, before the, the meeting, where do I find that in our documents that you handed out, the stormwater? Uh, so uh, the stormwater report that was submitted, in, which includes a, operations and management plan was uh, provided to the board only electronically um, just due to the oh. amount of pages the report was, um, it, which can be found on the town calendar uh, for tonight's meeting. Um, so anyone, um, any members of the public or the ZBA could find it there. So and, I didn't uh, miss it. <laughs> description of, of, of the stormwater management Thank and you. how they will be providing it. ongoing was... uh, maintenance of it. Good. All right. Thank you. Um, another question I had is, um, can we bring up the landscaping plan? Yes. this here is that landscaping plan yeah and if we could expand that the plan itself I, I don't need to see the legend at this point okay is there a particular area you'd like to well i first want to first want to ask about the caliper of the trees out front um, you know, if, are they, what size trees are you talking about in, um, planting to begin with and how big are they going to get? Andy, and, and I mean, um, I'll turn it over to you, but I know that through the discussion um, with the neighborhood and the discussion about the public shade tree, what Andy might have spec for these might 
be a little bit smaller than what we're actually going to plant. I think we're thinking about a uh, three to five inch caliper. Um, and what are those, Andy? 15, 10, 15 feet? Uh, so a, a five inch caliper tree is going to be enormous. Um, okay, it'll so maybe probably I'm be. Saying, yeah. Height, yes. Okay. Thank so, you. So, so right now we're proposing uh, between a, and we try to give a, a variation because of the landscape stock right now with everything that's gone on in the last two years with COVID. Um, yep. So we don't want to lock it in. So we have right now between a one and a half and a three inch caliper tree. Um, one and one and a half inch caliper tree, depending on the variety of it, um, you know, will be any bit anywhere between <clears throat> ten and twelve feet tall. Where a three inch caliper tree will be upwards of twenty feet tall um, on installation, and the intent for those um, are a, a nice red maples. So they'll they'll grow to be a big mature um, red maple um, okay. for those ones specific. Got it. And is, the, is it the same in the parking lot or will, will that be um, lower level, uh, not quite as um, thick and not quite as tall? Um, the, the ones in the parking lot are proposed, the, the larger trees that you're show, that we're showing in there, they, they are proposed to be a, a, okay. what, a installed height of, or installed of one and a half to three inch caliper tree um, as well, because we really want to try to get that shade and get that context um, so that it's not like just small whippy trees going in right away. Yeah, I think that's important. And would you, is, is there any concern on the part of the applicant if a condition would be that we take that one and a half to three inches as a guide for the trees that you're planting as opposed to, I don't know what, this, I, I'm not sure what that is. You said it might be different than what your intent is, but it, it would, sounds like an app updated it already. So yeah, if, if the question is, would you, ex we, we expect, and I'll back up and talk kind of holistically, yep. uh, we expect to, to build, if we're approved, to build what we're showing. And so if it says, if it calls out one and a half to three inch caliper, that's what we're gonna provide. If we can't find him, we have to come back to you. That's another story, but but just like with Jonathan's um, um, architectural plans, when you see trim board, there'll be trim board. Where you see clabbers, there'll be clabbers. Yep. So, what you see is the, somewhat what, what you get here. But for the trees, I don't know what that size right now is um, on the plan. And, and does it, it says 1AR, and I'm not sure what that means. Yeah, so, so that, that's, that's, that goes up to the legend. And then the legend, it, it, it highlights the, the species, the variety, the size that it's installed at, um, and the amount of them. So. You'll see the one and a half to two and a half inch caliper, and then some of them are the. Thank you. Yep. That makes sense. All right. And then the other thing I had on the on the groundskeeping plan, the landscaping plan. If we look at the areas where, um, sort of the, to avoid the heat islands or the cooling spaces in the parking lot, those are the areas where you're going to have um, you're, you're going to pile up snow as well. Sure. And there's plants underneath the tree underneath the trees, so. Number one, how do you maintain, again, this is about quality of life, maintaining this as a really attractive property and not something that has um, uh, traffic islands that have that kind of get uh, um, beat up during the winter and never really come back. How are you going to maintain those if you pile snow on that with grasses or plants or are you going to have to replace them every year? What's the plan for that in the future to maintain the integrity and the attractiveness of the project? For sure, it's it's a great question. Um, so the the plants that are specified in there are the most durable plants that we can find that that are native and and or naturalized. Um, they intentionally are are plants that um, can take a pretty severe punishment, um, and also some of them are perennials. So during the winter months. Um, there obviously won't be any any woody stuff um, for them to get damaged by. They'll come up in the spring. Um, but the intent here is that there's a full spring cleanup where the beds get raked out, new mulch compost gets put in. Um, you know, and then we do have notes in here that the the maintenance of these areas needs to be monitored and um, plants that don't make it need to be replaced um, to make sure that that, that happens. So again, that's, I haven't had a chance to look at the draft um, conditions that um, the staff has come up with, but they have not suggesting them, they're just putting them out there. 
but one of those would be for me would be that the landscaping plan has to accomplish that each year has to have a replacement of dead and damaged plants and continuous maintenance of those areas so that the the attractiveness of the property remains so that's something we should try to achieve maureen or, or draft up for the next meeting you know i, I want to op open this up to other board members i have more questions who can come back to me but i don't want to take up everybody's i don't want to dominate the time so i want to open it up to other other questions from other board members and so i'd open it go to tammy next if you have questions that you want to ask tammy um i i was on the i was thinking having this, a lot of the same thoughts that you were about the driveway elevation and i guess um my, i just to be clear about the drainage the lines that you show that have a d on them those are under under the pavement drains right and then the two catch the 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 um the places where the water goes in that's the typical silt stack is that what that is that what those things are that are on either side uh, if I'm, I just looking at, I'm looking at your drawing that shows this silt stack is that where the water is draining into oh i think you're looking at maybe erosion control map is what she's looking at yeah so the what so um on the plan that on the plan on the screen here, those those are catch bases. So typical catch bases, they have a graded inlet that allows water to um, to to enter into the the structure to get collected. Um, okay. What what I think you're referring to on the silt sack um, is that we provide a detail for during construction before the site is fully stabilized. Uh, the, any structures, uh, any catch bases would have silt sacks installed on the grate. Uh, to help filter out any um, any solids, any any silt that's in the runoff during construction. Okay. But once the site's fully stabilized and, and built out, those silt sacks would be removed, and and then the, the they would just function as standard uh, catch basins. Okay, I guess I was just trying to get an idea of the the size of uh, of the drain that the water is going into. So they're they're. Um, Below ground, they're cylindrical shaped structures. The inner diameter of them, they're concrete, and the inner diameter is four feet. Um, but what you see on the surface is only the grate of the structure. So it's a cast iron grate, and they are two feet by two feet, which is a okay. typical catch basin grate. All right, that's what I was wondering. And then I'm just wondering if there are any um, pictures that show the elevation of the entire property. I see the elevation like um, from one building to the parking lot and then another building to the parking lot. But I'm wondering if there's something that all together shows the elevation from the front all the way to where the woods begin. No, I don't think that we have one of those, but I, I'm sure that um, Andy can create one of those for the next uh, the next meeting. Andy, fair to say? Yes, we can we can definitely create a cross section. Um, Jonathan does have um, in one of his elevation plans. Um, it doesn't go all the way to the forested edge in the back, but it, it at least shows the relationship of the buildings to each other and the parking lot in between. Um, but we can certainly create one that goes from sunset through the first row of buildings, through the parking lot, through the second row of buildings, through the amenity space, and then um, out to the forest line for sure. All right, it would just help me see the flow of the sidewalks. And I see that you have a wheelchair access that's behind the um, the trash unit. And I'm just wondering what the grade is going to the amenities in the back. Um, and so I, I don't, you know, it's hard for me to tell if it's, you know, sort of sloped down, leveled off, sloped down, leveled off. Yeah, Matt, Matt might be able to speak to it, um, but yeah. I think if you, um, Tom, I don't know who's controlling right now. If it's Tom, if you want to zoom in somewhat to that area, um, so as as I believe as was mentioned earlier on, the amenity space in the back is fully accessible. So there's an accessible route provided from the the main area between the buildings, the parking lot area, all the way down and and over to the amenity space behind the building. So um, there's there yes. So there there's the, that route right there, which is behind the the, the waste uh, 
management area that that serpentines around. Um, and the reason it, it, it does that is in order to get the grades of the sidewalk to be accessible. Um, so you need a, you know, it's all about, there's a fixed um, vertical, you know, dimension right. that we need to achieve. So you need a certain uh, horizontal run in order to get the slopes and the grades of the walk to be compliant. Um, and so that, that's what's achieved here. So you can see there's a lot of um, spot elevations all along that that route um, showing that uh, there'll be, you know, each, so each leg of the, each of the three legs of that route will, will ramp as you go from uh, east to, to west. So from back toward the amenity area will ramp down obviously because uh, the amenity area is lower. And, and at each turn, each corner, there's a, uh, what we call a level landing. So you ramp down, there's a level landing five by five, you turn, then you ramp down again, level landing, turn, ramp down again, and then you're at that lower uh, elevation of, of the amenity space. So, um, you know, I can tell you our office takes that very, um, you know, seriously. And, and as you can tell by the, just the sheer number of spot grades on this plan, we looked at that very carefully, very thoroughly. And um, that, that is an accessible route, you know, under ADA and, and Massachusetts AAB, Architectural Access Board uh, requirements. It's, it's fully accessible to get down to that amenity space. Okay, that's just I, that's sort of why I wanted to see the elevation because it's hard for me. It's hard to tell. I mean, I can I can read the elevation numbers here, although there it says you know two thirty point six five on the top end. It doesn't maybe two twenty nine point two five a foot difference. I just I, I just visually um, from what I've seen it. it I, I would just like to see that a little better. And just one of the things that just so that we maybe don't disappoint you when we come back. It's you know, we're going to be able to show it like this, you yeah. know, where you have sunset up here and then kind of a cross section. So I don't know that we'll be able to achieve, you know, until we build it, showing you actually what it's going to look like. And, you know, this, Matt, is this a 5%, 2%, 5%, 2%, 5%? That's right. So, so the maximum, uh, when you have an accessible route, the requirement is that the maximum longitudinal grade, so the grade along the, along the route, um, cannot exceed 5%. Uh, so that's five feet in 100 feet, 5%, unless you provide a, a ramp. And then when you provide a ramp, there's, there's other criteria that go along with that. So we graded this route out so as not to exceed the 5%, um, so, so as not to need ramps. So th th this, this is a, an accessible route, longitudinal slope, you know, at or, or slightly less than 5% with the level landings at the turn, at the nine degree turns. Okay. I'm all set, Steve. All right. Um, Mr. Maxfield, do you have some questions? No, not right now at this time. Thank you, Steve. You bet. Mr. Meadows? Yes, I, I've got a series of questions. Many of them, can you hear me okay? Because I've got my earbuds in and sometimes they don't work. I can hear you. Okay. Uh, m most of these are in kind of inspired and follow up uh, uh, by the observations and recommendations from the planning board. Um, the first one may be relatively simple. Uh, I noticed that they also have uh, indicated a couple of times about the arborvitae. Um, and uh, uh, you're, I'm sure you're aware that Northampton and Greenfield both have got uh, some requirements for pollinators. And uh, it was mentioned that uh, most of the trees are going to be native. Uh, the arborvitae are the only ones that, that I could see in that quick glimpse that aren't uh, pollinators in the list. Wondering if there's a substance that could be functional rather than the, that are pollinators rather than the arborvitae. Uh, I don't know if you want all my questions at the same time, or you want to take them one at a time. I can I can answer that one. Um, so so as far as like a, a real um, evergreen screening in the Northeast, um, there, there's not a, a large variety of plant material to choose from um, that 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 check that box. Um, what I will say is that 
Um, the rest of the plant material really, really tries to pay attention to uh, pollinator-friendly, fruit-producing um, <clears throat> plant material um, throughout the you know throughout the year. So we have like the fir first early season stuff with some shad below service berry, which you're seeing blooming around town now, um, and stuff that. Um, will bloom <clears throat> all the way through the summer into the fall um, to really kind of elongate that as much as, as possible. Um, but the evergreen screening um, in a tight area, there's only a few a few plant species to really choose from, um, and that's why the, the arborvitae were chosen um, for that location. But the rest of the site has a, a pretty significant um, expansive diversity um, of pollinator plants. So maybe just one more point on on the arborvitaes. I know you know in the in the letter from the planning board, it was mentioned that they can grow quite tall. And I think, but to Andy's credit, he had forethought with that, given the existence of those trees along Fearing Street on the university's property, and chose the arborvitaes that only grow 12 to 15 feet tall, uh, instead of those that are going to potentially interfere with the the canopy of those other trees. So. Um, we didn't have that answer for the planning board. You know, it was more of a higher level discussion and the planning board didn't have all of the material that, that you have and they didn't have the professional um, responses like Andy wasn't, wasn't there. I, I didn't ask him to be there for, for those discussions. So just to kind of close the loop on the arborvitaes, it was something that you know, was thought about prior to its implementation. Okay, my, my primary was concern was about the pollinators rather than the height of it, but that's... Uh... If, if there were a pollinator that could be functional in there, that would be great. Um, another question, you know, the first thing you notice when you look at the plans is the amount of asphalt. Uh, I was just wondering if there had been given thought to a permeable or semi-permeable surface in there that wouldn't stand out quite so much. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. And yes, there was. Um, and they are quite a bit of a, a maintenance headache. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so for that, we tried to offset, offset it with um, kind of a robust landscaping plan in the amenity area in, in the back to say, okay, we could do you know, permeable pavers, you know, where you you're, you're, you have those little, um, helical blocks that you're using and you're growing grass in between, but just the maintenance of that, um, you know, snow plowing, et cetera, turns into a real management headache for a project, I think, uh, like this. So we thought about it. We thought it wasn't practical. Uh, we tried to offset it with the balance of what we're proposing. Another area that was brought up by the uh planning board that I was thinking of was uh, the EV char charging stations, uh, which I know are an extra expense, but uh, dealing with them in many situations that I uh, am involved with, uh, uh, the extra expense is easily offset in some regards by the fact that a lot of people are gonna have them and have EVs and want them. And Massachusetts has got a uh, multi-unit uh, and uh, dwelling unit program for uh, EVIP uh, that allows up to uh, got it here up to fifty thousand dollars per address, sixty percent of the cost of the hardware and installation for it. So uh, if that could be worked into the project, I think it would be viable and uh, reasonable to do so. Sure, and, and maybe a response to that. Um, so we are going to run conduit um, for EV charging stations. Uh, Barry has an EV charging station at the 70 University Drive project. Uh, I don't know if the program that you're talking about didn't exist at the time, but the EV charging station costs a significant amount of money. And at least to date, no one's used it. Now, I think everybody sees what's happening with the news, with the push for EV vehicles. And so I think we're probably in the same mind that um, 
they're going to become more prevalent. And, and to that end, we're going to run conduit for it. I don't know that we will provide a, an EV charging station with, with the program you're talking about. I think we'd certainly explore it, but we're at least going to run the infrastructure for it so that if and when it does um, become necessary, we're, we're definitely, we will be ready for it. Well, if, if you need it, I'd be happy to give the information to either yeah. Barry or Jonathan uh, so that great. you know Please. how to deal with that. Please. Uh, and the last thing is, is very similar. Um, there was mention by the planning board about the cost for rental maybe higher than a young family can afford. Uh, <clears throat> I was thinking one way to offset that, Jonathan, as you can imagine from me, uh, residential and small scale ground source heat pump rebate program, again, is available. Uh, and it is there to offset the cost of uh, ground source heat pumps in, uh, that could be uh, entered into the project. Uh, there are some relatively significant uh, returns on it from the state and the federal government. And uh, I don't see any indication of what the mechanical systems are being thought of yet. We, we, haven't, uh, we haven't made decisions yet on the, on the mechanical approach. Um, Barry has typically gone with air source heat pumps uh, because they've been, uh, they also have some pretty good uh, rebates with them. Although you're right, the, the ground source, the, the state is, is certainly incentivizing, um, but uh, we're open to, to multiple approaches. But um, in, in the end, part of it will be driven by a, by a, a cost decision. Um, but uh, certainly it will, there won't be a fossil fuel component to the heating uh, in any of these units. Uh, neither was, that was the case for both 70 University Drive and for University Drive South. Uh, as you know, air source heat pumps are not particularly efficient and they don't work below a certain temperature level. So the ground source heat pumps are, are certainly more functional than the air source heat pumps would be. Well, something we can explore. Take a look, yeah, for sure. Those are the questions I had. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Meadows. Um, Mr. Gilbert, do you have some questions? Yeah, I've got a few quick questions. Um, you know, first of all, thanks for putting together a pretty robust presentation here. Um, I think everyone's done a pretty good job of uh, like re-envisioning these two parcels here. Um, pretty thoughtful layout and, you know, nothing too, I think, aggressive with respect to an architectural approach. I think. You know, things fit in pretty well here. And there's been a lot of thoughtful landscaping um, given to this. A couple of my questions revolve around uh, the landscaping. Maybe you guys can just take me through a few things. Um, one, one question I have, is there, is there a bike rack anywhere on site? Um, I was looking through the project application and it mentioned that there is, but uh, can you point that out to me? Yeah, it's right over here. If you're following some of my mouse, if you follow it. Uh, okay. Right here is where that bike rack is. You know, one of the things to note, um, all units, save for these units right here, have storage areas. They all have basements, right? right? Even these, the two over two. And so part of the thought is folks would likely bring their bike into their unit. Yeah. One of the things that uh, we'll, we'll probably look at, um, we haven't talked about it with the design team yet, is, you know, maybe putting a, a bike rack over here more proximate to this unit just because mm -hmm. they're the ones that don't have the storage. So I can imagine somebody, you know, coming in the back door, leaving their bike, walking up the stairs, going to, you know, their kitchen. Same thing over here. Um, you know, there's storage everywhere else, but we do have one proposed here. You know, we may think of keeping that and, and adding one. Okay. Yeah, great. Um, that kind of pertained to my second question is trying to understand what that landscape area behind the dumpster uh, was in particular. So um, helpful for that. Yeah, I mean, it might be useful to, to add that other bike rack um, on that area of the site, just as you're saying, you know, with respect to those units not having lower storage. But I, I would agree with you, most likely, uh, you know, tenants will be putting their bikes down in that basement area. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Another question, I know you guys are providing, I think it's like nine additional parking spaces then required. Um, do those are you considering those as uh, partial visitor parking spaces or can you walk me through what you're thinking of with respect to yeah. visitor parking? Sure. So 
Um, under the bylaw, there's 17 units, 34 spaces are required. We're providing right. 43. Right. Right? So you're right, there's nine. Uh, of those nine, three of them are ADA. And so the way we look at it is those are restricted. There, there may be a tenant who utilizes them, but there may not. So those have to remain open and you can't necessarily double count them. Right. So assuming that they remain open, that leaves six and those mm -hmm. six would be visitor spaces. Okay. Okay, great. Uh, helpful. Good to know. Is there a specific area that you would be considering those being located just out of curiosity? You know, it's a, it's a good question. We haven't, um, I could see them, um, you know, so we will have a, and this is probably something I forgot to mention. So I'm happy that you brought it up a, a, a parking, uh, registration system. So tenants uh -huh. need to, so each, each unit has, can have two, um, vehicles and what they do is they present their registration barry keeps a log he presents them with a sticker they put the sticker in their window and then so you know who the unit you know the, who the residential cars are we haven't talked about whether or not we're going to have designated visitor parking mm -hmm. probably not a bad idea um and if so i could see it dispersed equally throughout evenly throughout the 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 um the complex you know thinking one here maybe one here one here, thinking one here, something like that. So right. if that's something the board's interested in, then we can certainly you know, have some visitor spaces demarcated. Yeah, I, I think it would be useful just to see what that looks like, um, especially you know, with, with having like a sort of plus six number um, that you're providing, which I mean, honestly, I think it's kind of a good thing here. Um, let me see, uh, I had two quick other questions. One retaining, uh, pertaining to the retaining wall along fearing, so that's um that's six feet tall. Is that correct? So it's let me get back to the grading plan. So I think in maybe one place it is a little bit tall. It's about at its at its six plus. point six and change. Yeah. Okay. And then so um, what? How does it slope down then? So right so, here you'll see bottom of wall two twenty two fifty. Yeah. Top of wall two twenty nine twenty five. Yep. And then as you move east, because so we're, we're going this way. Yep. Um, you've got top of wall at 233, bottom of wall at 231. Got it. Top got of wall it. at 233, bottom. So it starts here and then it just, yep. you know, you can imagine it just growing, uh, totally. so to speak, because we have to main, we have to keep it level behind yep. it. And so that's yep, really, yep. and there's the break between, you know, you've got, this goes down and, and Matt, I don't know if you know off the top of your head, I want to say totally 10 plus percent to get on fearing street as far as how yeah. quickly that drops when you see it. Um, and so that's why we're proposing the Arborvitae. And then on top of this wall, we're proposing that uh, faux uh, iron fence. Yeah, yeah, okay, great. No, that's, that's helpful. Um, so one, maybe this is just an architectural question uh, or landscape um, thing. It would be helpful to see uh, just like a quick rendering or perspective view from Fearing Street, um, just to look, yeah. you know, kind of into the, uh, into the like drive aisle area. I'm also just curious to know what the facades of those two buildings, building six, and I guess building, uh, one, just whatever South of it, um, look like. So that would be, if you could provide that, I think that would just be helpful to orient uh, a little bit more. But with respect to the question on the retaining wall, that's that's pretty much um, what my concern was. I just wanted to make sure that wasn't like a, a step six feet. Is that block also? Actually, is that like seeing block that you're proposing? Or? Yeah, I think it's going to be. Um, oh boy, I'm I'm blanking on what it's called. But yeah, I mean stacked block, not cinder block, but but stacked block. It's oh, okay. There's yep. one similar. If you drive by uh, one university, drive south. You know, if you're coming from the west and traveling east. There's a retaining wall. We would yep. expect the same sort of retaining wall over here. Okay, great. That's helpful. Um, final question: the transformer. Um, so I was I'm just looking over the site plan here. I know that's like you know sort of surrounded by bollards. It's a requirement. Um, I was going to ask if there was any thought to you know fencing that off or doing something a little more decorative since that's right there on the main corner. But it looks like there's a privacy fence. Um, so correct me if I'm wrong. There's like a privacy fence on the pier inside of that. Is that correct? I don't think so. Let me bring this. Uh, let me bring this up. It's like site plan four. 
Yeah, and I what I was going to look at is um, the old. landscaping plan because I think that's where. And Andy, I don't know if you. Um, and this might be, you know, one of those things that. So this this tree that we're proposing was yeah. supposed to replace the tree that is was going to come down, but now is staying. And so, frankly, I don't know, and and we can have an answer for you before the next time. The interaction between the existence of this transformer and the the retention of that tree mm -hmm. and if that tree is now being saved if this transformer needs to be relocated if it does we'll show you an updated plan but to answer your question directly you know i think what we're looking to do and andy correct me if i'm wrong we're just looking to adequately screen this i don't know yeah. by code if you can put like a fence around it um i think they have to keep it open and accessible so the best yeah. we can, i think is vegetative plantings yeah, no, it, it's helpful actually that you pull this up because I'm looking at the, the civil site plan and uh, you know it's it's uh, it's calling out like bollards on a on a pad with a little fence. So I mean, basically, what I was trying to drive at is that this approach that you know we're looking at with the landscaping would certainly be uh, preferred uh, to to sort of on the civil drawing. But um, you're bringing up a good point. I mean, it's worth uh, consideration with respect to that existing tree. Um, and you know, if, if the transformer can in fact sort of exist there, but, um, that withstanding, uh, this is sort of answering what I was driving at. If, if we can landscape that instead, and it looks like that's what's being provided. So, uh, all good with me. That clears it up. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I just have a couple of points and I want to get to the public comments and we can come back and ask, ask more questions, but, um, we're getting on after eight o'clock and, and I wanna make sure that we have enough time for public comment tonight. Uh, but I wanted to emphasize two things. Number one, I, I agree. I, I think the idea of a, of a elevation from Faring Street looking into the property would really be helpful to visualize the, the fencing and the arborvitaes as well as the, how the driveway looks. I mean, cause that, I think that would be a good, I, I agree with uh, Mr. Gilbert on that. And the other thing is if nothing else, perhaps, um, for the next meeting, draft up a um, what you what it's going to look like if that tree is saved, uh, and so we can see it because we, we'll need to, to if if that tree is going to be saved, and there's a, a different way we're going to treat the area around there. You have to have it on the drawing so we can say built is submitted, right? So if you can do that by the next meeting, that'd be helpful and it'd probably answer the questions that Mr. Gilbert had as well. And I'll, and I'll put this up just if, if you have other questions, but just we have, I understand what you're asking for, but I think this at least gives you a little bit of perspective. I think what we'll do is we'll get you something that shows a little bit more of the um, built in, build in the topography. Yeah. So I, what I'd like to do now is turn to public uh, comments, Maureen. And so let's, let's open it up. And I want to tell people um, if you're, if you wish to make a comment on this, um, Please introduce yourself, give your name and address for the record. Uh, please hold your comments to around three minutes. Um, know that, um, that we probably have several people that wanna, that wanna speak and we wanna make sure we give everybody an opportunity to do that if they can tonight. Um, and we've got, gotta get rid of this. Attend, we've got uh, 14 attendees. So why don't we, um, we have the first person Frank? up there is interested. Yep. Uh, Frank, if you could state your name and your address. 140 Faring Street in Amherst. And Susan Hugis, 140 Faring Street in Amherst. We're together, sorry. Okay, please proceed, Frank well, and Susan. My, my first question or concern has to do with with the with with the drainage, we've had problems with our basement <clears throat> as as close to southwest area and so forth as we are. Sometimes uh, being a little inundated, and I'm concerned with this new configuration of the landscape to directly to the to the west of us that we might experience some. Uh, feedback from the underground streams and the normal flow of the water into our basement. That's one concern. The other concern is, is environmental. It, it, it's it's uh, depending on 
<clears throat> the ecology of the area. I understand the area down west of the proposed development is, or at least at one time was protected wetlands. And I'm wondering what, uh, what, what uh, danger there might be to the remaining wetlands there if this program is approved. That, that's one of the concerns that I have. The other concern is parking, which I think in, in this neighborhood of the university is very, very difficult to find. And we find many, many people parking where they shouldn't be parking. And I'm concerned that people might find the parking lot for the proposed development, a handy way, to, uh, hand them, a handy way of, of parking their vehicles while they're attending classes or teaching or something like that. The third is traffic. Oh. <clears throat> since, the, since the roundabout at the end of Fairing, that is on the west side of Fairing Street was finished, we have noticed <coughs> tremendous increase in numbers of vehicular, vehicular traffic coming past our, our house. In fact, it's actually rather difficult to cross Fearing Street now at some, sometimes during the day. I can anticipate this would only get worse with the development as, as we proposed it. And fourth, I'm concerned about the human, the, the human dimension of what's going on here. You have a, a 17, or I think it is 17, uh, unit un, unit plan, plan ahead of you and I'm concerned that some of these might be interested in shall we say catering to Southwest students we've had some experience with this before oh. <laughs> where <clears throat> houses around the Southwest corridor have been really, really helpful hosts to some of the party goers along Fa Fairing and Sunset Avenue. And I'm, I'm afraid that we're looking at another- Potential. An, another potential problem with, with uh, partying on, and geared to undergraduates that we might find be coming to the Southwest yeah. dormitory area. And that's, those are the questions that I have. My problem, I would like to chime in about what's happening with the basement. We have an understanding that Tan Brook is actually underneath our house. And what we're afraid of is that if you disrupt it, does that mean we get inundated with water? Um, we have mitigated it very successfully. We also find if the town sewer system gets backed up, then we're in trouble again. The, the, just the sewer for the storm drains. So we have very concerns about that. And when you start digging up and start doing all this stuff, we don't know what's gonna to happen to our house. What, what guarantee do we have that we won't have major problems? I mean, I wanted to bring that up. Number two, for the traffic, um, when we didn't have the four-way stop, we were at Lincoln, we were having accidents like you wouldn't believe. I mean, you sit down to dinner and the police were coming. The four-way stop has helped. They still run through the stop sign. Stop sign. I'm very concerned with the extra traffic going down Sunset, partially because it's a narrow street. They even park the car to cars to keep the cars from parking on the street or even slowing us down. They don't even leave, the residents don't leave enough space even for a fire truck to go through, which has been a big worry of mine for years. So that's been a real problem for me. Uh, again, we are worried about the foot traffic for everyone. I agree that it's nice that you wanna do all this and make sure that it's faculty and whatever and whatever. But I think we have to worry about what's happening to the rest of the neighborhood, which I don't think the town has been planning for. Also, I would not put the, uh, the electric box on the corner as you design and you play your your, uh, your plan right now. I can, we already had an accident at this corner at Sunset and Fearing just the other day. I could see a car plowing into it. So we are very worried about the foot traffic. We are here on the weekends. We see tremendous amounts of kids walking down the street and there's no place for them to go, but to actually go down the street at times. So those are our major things. Um, otherwise, I hope that they really do take care of the, plantings around the, the area and keep it up because 
I can't see all that you're putting in there that the management company is going to clean it up and keep it that way. I have a real problem with that. Uh, but basically, we're more the thing we're really worried about is tan book going underneath the houses because they built a new house next door to us and they've had water problems. We know. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you each Mr. had three Chair. minutes. Thank you very much. Mr. Chair, could I? I don't know if you want us to respond, but I could show you one screen. You know what I, you know what <laughs> Whatever I, you want me to do. Yep, let's do this. Let's have the let's have you respond to the comments from after all the public comments are done, so we don't get into a back and forth. I think it's the best the best way to do it. Fine by me. Yep. Um, I guess I'd go next to is it uh, uh, Pam is Rooney? Please, do we need to stay? No. Well, nope. Okay, uh, Pam. Uh, state your name and your address. <clears throat> Excuse me, Pam Rooney, Forty Two Cottage Street. Thanks for letting me uh, speak. Um, this is this is not as serious an issue as the previous speakers who have a real concern and I hope you address. Um, this has to do with um, trees and drainage. So the existing tree that was shown uh, that has been protected, um, I think I would agree with, with folks that are asking for a realignment of that sidewalk for the least disturbance, it would be too bad to have taken the time to save that tree, but have it damaged by construction, um, which can easily happen. Um, so, and and also reiterate the uh, the removal or replacement of the electrical box. Um, it, first of all, it's unsightly, and second, as the previous person just said, it it, it could be a problem if somebody plows into it. So, similar to the tree on on sunset, the trees along Fearing Street are mature. They are in pretty good shape as far as I can tell. And I wonder if the board can order that their protection be uh, maximized. Um, the, the location of the retaining wall and the arborvitae are seriously in within the root zone of those trees. So if you can protect as much as possible the root zone of those trees um, and order that the construction of the retaining wall is, is done from within the site rather than from the street side. Um, and that the arborvitae, I don't know how you plant arborvitae and not, dis not disturb the root zone. So I'm not sure if that will be successful. The last item is uh, looking at the drainage plan. I appreciate it when you uh, zoomed in pretty closely. It was um, interesting to me and I think maybe needs a second look that building number five is, seems to be located at the high point of the parking lot where you have, you have the grades pitching to either side, yet building number five is also the lowest uh, elevation of the three in the back row and the, and the um, exit doors to the west are very low. Um, I think you should take a look at the drainage from those exit doors uh, to the backyard and you may need to regrade so that there's more than, uh, uh, my quick calculations were that it was less than 1% slope from the, some of the back doors to the 228 L, um, uh, elevation. So you may need to wrap that um, differently. I would also be concerned just given that you have you have a fairly steep slope between the buildings. Um, not a whole lot of runoff, but it will puddle around the back of the buildings. And I think given that there are concerns about site water already, um, I wouldn't want to uh, exacerbate that. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rooney. Um, uh, I we have uh, Jennifer, Jennifer Taub is, is next, right? Yep. Um, so Jennifer, if you could state your name and your address. Um, uh, hold on a second. Maybe I didn't press the. Um, hmm. Wait. Uh, did you disappear? Uh, the hand is gone. She's down on the list. Farther down. down. List? Uh, oh, I see her. Uh, allowed to talk. Okay. Thank you. Um, Am I unmuted? Here we go. Okay, thank you. 
Um, my name is Jennifer Taub. I live at 259 Lincoln Avenue, and I am speaking tonight, you know, as a resident um, of the uh, around the corner from where this development is proposed. Um, if I if I heard correctly, um, twelve of the seventeen units will be four bedrooms. Okay, um, and what I what concerns me about that is I you know appreciate that um, you know the developer um, has you know stated a interesting commitment in uh, renting you know to families and young faculty and you know um, maybe retirees. I guess what I'm saying is year round residents and you know not exclusively to undergraduates so my concern with that number of four bedrooms is the way the four bedroom units will be priced i think they will be out of reach to anyone you know but for you know unrelated individuals or students each paying per bedroom so i would ask i don't know if the uh zba can request more three bedrooms than four bedrooms, but I'm, I'm very concerned about um, the success of attracting non, you know, undergraduate households to be able to pay the rent of a four bedroom. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. <clears throat> um, so next, next we is have, uh, uh, Janet McGowan. Um, I would like to talk. Hi, Janet, if you could state your name and your address. Hi, um, my name is Janet McGowan and I live at 706 Southeast Street. Um, I'm speaking as a resident and not as a member of the planning board, although I did see this in front of the board. I really applaud um, the desire to have a, this attractive multifamily mixed occupant development um, and that um, Mr. Roberts wants families and you know older adults and the neighborhood wants the same group of people and needs it for its own stability. The question is, how do you make that happen? Because the rents, you know, for a four bedroom are going to be close to four thousand dollars, which would put it, I think, out of reach of a lot of families. Um, as well as, you know, it's a great location next to UMass, but it's also next to the Southwest Towers. Um, so my question is, you know, if, if the goal is to have families and non undergraduate students predominantly at the house, how do you make sure that happens? And what happens? If it does later become, you know, the a new developer or a new owner decides to start running, you know, renting to undergraduates, what's the impact on the neighborhood? And I think people would agree that it's not going to be positive. And so my suggestion is that the ZBA um, attach a condition limiting the percentage of undergraduates that can rent. Say 25% of the units can be rented to undergraduates. And I can speak from my own experience in my neighborhood which has some rental housing that I think that there's a, a stultifying effect of boring people on undergraduate students. Like, you know, as our dull daily lives of regular adult folk and, you know, driving our kids to and fro or going down to the um, cumbies, we, we, we have a tempering effect on undergraduates or younger people. And I think that, um, I think it's an important condition to impose because, you know, the most expensive housing in Amherst, it goes to, you know, rental housing is primarily focused at undergraduate students. We see that downtown. We see that in, uh, off of Route 9 in the new developments. And so if, if everybody wants it to be family housing, everybody wants it to be young faculty, everybody wants, you know, older adults, then why not just impose that as a condition that no more than 25% of the units can be rented to undergraduates? And we can board them into good behavior. And um, you know, if Mr. Roberts sells his development in 10, 20 years, we know that that will that will still happen, and it will it will stay in the neighborhood, and you know, be a new form of housing for Amherst. It, it's kind of a a new model. So I would really encourage the ZBA to consider that condition and actually just add it to the permit. Thank you very much. Thank you, Janet. Next is Dorothy Pam, if you could state your name and your address. Hello, uh, my name is Dorothy Pam. My address is 229 Amity Street, and I'm speaking as an individual and as a neighbor. Um, obviously, a tremendous amount of work has been going into this plan, um, just the, the whole thing about the water. I do hope that uh, you do examine the questions that were brought to you by the res nearby residents 
because the first when I first heard that the parking area was down a slope, I immediately could see that there were a lot of problems that could happen there. But I mainly want to support what has been said by Janet McGowan and Jennifer Taub about the four bedroom apartments. Um, we talk of it as a family apartment, but let's think about couples as well. Uh, students, graduate students who are a couple, uh, old people who are a couple. Um, that's two bedroom apartments. And that makes that rent of that apartment much more affordable for actual people who might live and want to, to rent an apartment on that area. Um, we need new housing. We need a variety of housing. Um, we also need our strong neighborhoods. So this housing development must be something that helps, but does not hurt the neighborhood that it, it's on the edge of. And I know that that's the goal. I know that's the aim, but I think that I agree with the two speakers I mentioned before that reducing the number of four bedroom apartments would really help that to be a reality. Thank you. Thank you, Dorothy. Next we have Anna. You can state your name and your address. Um, hi, my name is Anna Schrade and I live on 155 Sunset Avenue. And I'm speaking as an individual and as, re as a resident, of course. And I would just like to ask you if you could share a little bit about the timeline of this project. So what is your timeline regarding the project? And I want to second what was just said before about the really the need to attract really not undergraduate students to this project. <laughs> I mean, yeah, there has been so many really important arguments being made already. So I'm really interested in the timeline. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank okay, you. Let's see here. Um, who do we have next here? Oh, um, hmm. um, Michelle, if you could state your name and your address. Hi, it's not Michelle, it's James, um, and I'm a resident at 60 Fearing Street. I've also uh, lived in the Valley my whole life, and I'm a landlord here in the Valley. I've been doing that for the past 20 years. So I have a little bit of a different perspective on some of this, and I hear the concerns about, well, before I get to my landlord bit, moving the existing um, house into the wetlands next to our place um, is going to create more problems with Tanbrook. Um, the Hugis family were talking about that and uh, we're very concerned about uh, Tanbrook as well. Um, so the ratio of parking to bedrooms is one of the things that caught my ear. Uh, someone mentioned that there's gonna be um, more than one person per bedroom. That's almost inevitable when you're getting the younger people and uh, they, it seems like everybody has a car now. So I think the minimum um, ratio would have to be more than one to one with the bedrooms. Um, the other thing is that the um, floor plans that I see, um, they are more uh, similar to my daughter's um, uh, undergrad suite than it is to a, a family apartment. And, um, just as a practical matter, I don't know of any way to say that you're not going to rent to any group of people without falling into discrimination problems. So you can't say no undergrads or limit it. It's just it's a, it's discrimination. So if these um, units are built uh, in a undergrad friendly configuration, which they are, and they're priced at a way where the average family is not going to be able to afford it, which they are then you're gonna have a lot of undergrads in there. And I think that we should just be grownups about this and say, there's an undergrad shortage, uh, uh, undergrad housing shortage in this town. And um, this contractor's coming in and doing something that, you know, in many ways I think is, is quite good and um, quite needed. And if we can be honest and say, this is gonna be undergrad housing. When I interview families that wanna live in one of my apartments, they ask me, do any undergrads live in the building? Because they don't want to live next to that. They know what they're getting into. So this is not going to be family housing. I, I just think that's a stretch. But if it is going to be undergrad housing, can there be ways where it's managed as such? Having an on-site property manager, 
having a lease that limits sublets or excludes that, having a lease that uh, limits overnight guests and some way of enforcing that so that some of the most egregious behaviors of the undergrads can be taken care of and they can become good neighbors. Um, the other thing that I heard mentioned was about the waivers for some people with affordable housing. And again, that's one of those things you can't discriminate against someone who has a waiver. They're, they're treated like everybody else and they put pay full rent. Um, and then with the uh, cameras, I'm just wondering if those are gonna be monitored 24 hours, if it's just gonna be something that goes on to a chip someplace and you know is reviewed when uh, somebody has time. But I live next door to one of Mr. Roberts' um, houses right now. And he told me um, when I spoke to him that it was gonna have undergrads in there. And it doesn't, um, excuse me. He said they were gonna have graduate students in it and it's full of undergrads. Um, okay, you know, they, they, they yes. need a place to live too, but uh, at least let's be honest with each other about what we're talking about here. And let's put in place some safeguards so that it doesn't uh, uh, deteriorate the quality of life in the um, neighborhood and protect all of our quiet use and enjoyment of our properties. Thank you. Thank you, James. And there's like no other individuals who have raised their hand. All right. All right. Pa uh, Pam Rooney has raised her hand again. We'll let her make a quick. Oh, uh, yeah. Pam? Pam, go ahead. Thank you, Pam Rooney, 42 Cottage Street. I don't believe that students are a protected class. I think we can, in fact, say no undergrads. Thank you. Thank you. That's a, all right. Um, let's, if there's anybody else that wishes to speak who hasn't spoken yet, um, please indicate. If not, we're going to go uh, back to the hearing and have the applicant respond to some of those questions, the concerns and questions raised by the uh, public. And to the extent that you can answer them tonight, that's great. To the extent that you need to go back and gather other information, um, we can do that at the next meeting. So, Mr. Reedy, um, do you want to try to run through some of those questions in the order in which they were, uh, in the order in which they were raised, uh, and help us? Because I think they raised some good questions. Sure, I'll I'll do my best. So so first, yep. um, this is 140 Fearing Street. <clears throat> if everybody can, everybody see my screen? Yeah. You should mm -hmm. see uh, it right. So it's a topographical map from the Amherst GIS system. 140 Fearing Street. You got 260 as an elevation here. 255 as an elevation. This everything down here is down here, right? It is lower than um, this property. And so when we're talking about stormwater, it's, you know, water runs downhill. So, you know, I don't, I don't know how this property would impact something up gradient, you know, severely up gradient, 20 feet up gradient um, from them. So I don't know that, that that's a, an actual impact of this project. So that's kind of response number one. Second, relative to uh, environmental concerns. So we had SWCA, uh, who's based out of Amherst. We had wetland scientists go out to the site. Um, the conservation agent did a desktop review. We had that confirmed by a field review by SWCA and there aren't any resource areas uh, on the site. So there, there aren't any wetlands. There may be some further west. I, west, I, I wouldn't doubt it if down by University Drive, because I think that kind of acts like a, a dam of sorts at the bottom of the hill. I would bet it's wet down there, but that's far from our site. Um, and I mean, as Matt will tell you and has told you, you know, part of the obligations under the stormwater handbook in Massachusetts is to make sure that you're not increasing and in fact are, are keeping the same or decreasing the flow of water that's leaving the site and, and that's what we've done. So uh, as far as environmental impact, uh, traffic impact, we talked about the traffic study that um, there, there's going to be a minimal, I mean 0.5% increase in traffic at that intersection with nine additional morning trips and 12 additional afternoon trips 
added to the surrounding roadway network as a result of this. And then there's the underlying theme of use and management, I'll say. Um, and I think that's where we start is it comes down to management, right? The idea here is we're not blowing smoke. We'd like to have families here. Will there be undergraduates? I bet. I'm sure that uh, to have a diversified, mixed, well-balanced development, you're going to have a bit of everything. And I think that's what makes a good community. And it comes down to management and self-regulation and humanity of between and amongst folks and not prohibition or potential discrimination against folks because of the, the, the class, protected or not, that they're in. That's not what we're into. We're into uh, respectful operation, respectful inhabitation, uh, and respectful management of a place like this. And so, you know, we don't get a second chance to, to build these units. You can build four bedrooms. And, and frankly, there's not a huge cost difference between a three bedroom and a four bedroom. And you can have a, a couple live in a four bedroom and they may be just as happy to have all that space. To have the four bedroom, the space of a four bedroom, I think is important, especially given the society that we live right now. So we've, we've been able to fit what we think is a, a, a really well thought out development here. And we hear the neighbors, but it comes down to management. And I think you know, the board through their conditions through the lease um, and, and through who's actually managing it, can see it to be well managed and alleviate those issues. Um, I mean, I think those were those were most of it. As far as the trees on Fearing Street, you know, we'll we'll bring in an arborist, a certified arborist when we're doing the work over by the, the retaining wall uh, and the planting of those arborvitaes, just to make sure that we're minimally impacting those uh, existing trees on Fearing Street. Uh, and, and we just also to note, I think it was James who mentioned it, we're, we're not saying that um, more than one person per bedroom. So, I mean, if a couple wants to stay in the same bedroom, by all means, um, but we're not saying that there can be multiple double occupancy. That's not how we're, we're planning this. I mean, and for the next hearing, um, Mr. Chair, I think what we'll do is we'll get you some finishes to show what the interior will be like. We'll show you some of the the finishes of seven university drive of one university drive south which like i said this is this is going to be just like um and i think the parking to bedroom ratio is like 0.7 something 0.73 maybe which is i think completely in line with with what you see in other recently approved projects and it works and and that's what we're expecting here as well so i don't know if there's anything else oh timeline thank you um we're hoping to start in June, so to relocate the houses, you know, start um, to, to decommission, I'll call it, those houses and to relocate them in July. Um, there is a process that we have to go through for the relocation, both the local historic district commission and, you know, what, 46 Fearing Street. There are wetlands on site, but we can stay at least 50 feet away, which is the requirement. So there's a process that has to be gone through, but the, the timeline is about, you know, June of this year for hopeful occupancy, you know, everybody um, for, for tenancies works on an academic year. So hopeful occupancy, September of 2023. So it's a little over a year build, you know, 14, 16 month build, um, site work, et cetera. The whole site will have a construction fence around it. Um, there'll be a construction trailer on site. Um, and, and obviously Barry's, Barry's gonna be the one who's building this. So. He's going to be the person to call if there's any issues. Great. Thank you, Mr. Reedy. Um, I had some more questions. I'd like to open it up again for um, board members to ask questions if they have any or to for us to discuss um, considerations if, after we pose any questions that um, board members may have. I have a couple of questions. and. And then we can um, open it up to other questions as well. So, um, one of the, for the next meeting, can we have um, estimated rents so we know what it, what these things are going to rent out for? Um, I don't know if you have that. You probably haven't said it yet. I don't know if you yeah, made that public. Yeah, I mean it's going to be market, but it helps us. But it helps us just with the market. I don't know what the market is without you know kind of that. Um, and this is a year. I know it's a year out before you'll have it, but. 
can you have give us some kind of a, a ballpark estimate of what those rents are likely to be? Because there's a lot of, I think everybody has an idea and if, uh, whether it's right or wrong. So that would be helpful. Yeah, we can. And you know, what I'll, what I'll say now is um, one of the things, so I've, I've done a bit of an analysis, you know, considering housing prices, uh, mortgage interest rates, et cetera, here in the Valley. And so if you have a four bedroom, you're probably talking, you know, between 550,000 to $600,000 for, for a four bedroom house in Amherst. Um, 30 year mortgage at that amount, assuming no money down. So hundred percent finance, which, you know, you're probably going to talk 80, 85, 90, 95% of a loan, but still let's just use it for an example plus taxes, plus insurance, not including maintenance, right? So if you had a home and not including your effort to snowplow, to, to get a landscaper in there, to cut the grass, to, to buy a lawnmower, any of that stuff. At $600,000 per month, you're probably at about $4,500 without any maintenance. At $550,000, you're probably at about $4,250 a month. And so even at 4,000, you know, cause I would expect the four bedrooms between 4,000 and $4,500, you know, so I don't know where that ends up. Um, but you're about in line with, with what someone would have for plus, you know, for, for buying a house. Cause here there's maintenance, there's a problem. You pick up the phone, you call the management company. You don't have to worry about snow plowing. You don't have to worry about shoveling. You don't have to worry about um, lawn care. You get the amenities. Uh, and like I said, if there's an issue, there's an issue with the refrigerator. There's an issue with the water toilet like you name it. And, you know, there's a value to that that we haven't even factored in. So that's just, just to put into context with where we're at in the market and then two bedrooms, you know, let's assume a little shy of $400,000 for that. Even at, you know, again, um, 30 year mortgage taxes and insurance, you're at about $3,000 a month without any maintenance. And these rents will be lower for two bedroom. The rents will be lower than $3,000 a month. I don't know what they'll be, but you know, maybe between 2,500 and 2,800. I'm, I don't know, but certainly less than what it would cost for somebody to, to buy plus maintain a residence. And then you've got the affordable units and those affordable units um, will be less than the 80%, less than the 30% of the 80%, 30% of 70%. I want to say it's something like $1,200 a month, you know, versus market rate at you know, 25 to 2,800 dollars a month. Um, so, did, you know, that's that's probably about as good of an answer because the, everybody sees what's happening with materials, um, with labor. I mean, there's a lot of cost that goes into this, and landscaping isn't cheap. I mean, there's there's a lot. So we're trying to be as sensitive as we can. We think that there is a family market, given the numbers that I just said. There's also an attractiveness, I think, to families because they, what if they're just visiting for a semester? What if they don't want to live? They want to, they want to live here yet. What if they want to live here, but don't find the perfect house? I mean, that's why I think given the, 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 the corpus, you know, the comprehensive nature of this, I think we're right in line with, with what, and you, people may say families may not be able to afford it, but families who maybe want to live here, maybe living in a place with a lower rent where by them moving here to a, to a potentially nicer spot, Somebody who couldn't afford the four thousand or forty five hundred can move into three thousand, thirty two fifty, whatever it happens to be somewhere else. So, you know, it's a little bit of a domino effect, but I think you know, that's what that's what we're looking at for rents. Um, I'm looking at the planning board's comments, and one they have on pedestrian uh, circulation. Um, and they say building C should have an access path on the southern edge of the building leading from the parking area to the front entry. Can we pull up um, the schematic of building C? Yeah. So I, so I can it's see a, what that is. Yeah, it's a really good suggestion, actually. Let me get it up. All right, hopefully everybody can see this. Um, so I think we're talking about this building right here. So every other building has access from the parking lot. Um, and it was something that they had brought up and we haven't changed the plans because we wanted to have these conversations mm -hmm. before we go through the, the time and expense of plan iterations. You know, these units access from the parking lot, these units access from the parking lot. Here, uh, there's no access from the parking lot. Is, is, and when I say that, there's no, really? well, there is, 
in the form of walking up this drive to here and then into the, the front end of these units. Oh. So there's, there's two solutions, uh, maybe three solutions. One of them is to stripe this driveway, you know, stripe a portion of this driveway um, because it'll be the inhabitants here. One solution is to put a sidewalk here, but it's a little tight. And the other is it, it would cause a change of the design of the interior of the, the building, but to put stairs on the interior so that this would be kind of the common access to all of the units. So that, you know, these units would have access from here and then there would be some internal access. But that's something, frankly, that we're talking about. Um, and I probably gave you the hierarchy of the order that we would look at, but this is where I think some of the conversation needs to happen and, and we just have to hear mm -hmm. feedback. Yeah. Hey, Tom, if I could just uh, add on Absolutely. to that, uh, the, the lowest tier kind of option. Right now there's access for the flats that are in the back. Um, mm -hmm. If we have the stairways from above continue down to the ground uh, floor, we wouldn't be able to do two two bedroom units. We would maybe do three studio units, or maybe we could squeak in two one bedrooms in the studio or something like that. It, it would change the unit mix in the building. But it would seem to me that it'd be, it, it wouldn't be attractive to, be, to have your parking behind the building and having to walk around the front to get into your, to your unit. It would seem to me to be less than desirable. And, and boy, um, changing that driveway, the driveway off sunset to make, are you talking to allow, allowing, potentially, potentially allowing parking in that driveway and narrowing no, the driveway? No, 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 no. Just, bit, no, okay. When I say striping, I mean just, you know, how there's like a crotch, it's like a crosswalk, but just along the, the oh, side here. I got, I got, I thought you were talking parking stripes. Okay. No, it's probably the practical path of what people would take if this was a design that was implemented. I would imagine people would come up walk up here and then go into their individual units. But, but yeah, I mean, it's something that if that's a, if that's a concern for the board, because I've heard you, Mr. Chair, you know, and I don't disagree with it is, is thinking about that corpus of the, the, the project and making sure that it's all attractive, you know, so that the, it's mm -hmm. higher end where it's going to attract, um, you know, folks who are going to respect the property in the neighborhood. And so, yeah, yeah. you know, with that, you know, what's maybe Jonathan and Barry, we take a look at what that looks like. And yes, it's going to change the, the unit mix, but let's see what that ultimately looks like. And I don't know if, if and I'm not quite sure you would know better if that um, having two one bedrooms um, may be less, more attractive to, um, you know, a, a grad student or more attractive to uh, uh, somebody on sabbatical here for a year. Uh, at, at UMass, as opposed to not very attractive to an undergrad. So that's some, I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, I assume it might might very well be. Huh. I know I never wanted to live by myself when I was an undergrad, so uh, I don't know about everybody else. Um, any other questions from other board members? Yes. Yeah, no. Mr. Meadows. Um, question that the T in the corner at uh, Sunset and Fearing, is that the tree or is a transformer? Transformer. transformer. I, I, I would absolutely say that it cannot be in that location. That's a very poor choice. It needs to either be farther down Sunset Street or down Fearing where there's less of a chance of, of an accident. And I think some of it's uh, with the utilities, so we'll we'll talk to them. But I I don't think we disagree with you. Okay. Um, the only other thing, you know, I mentioned to Jonathan, uh, air source heat pumps are not suitable for New England. Simple statement. And, and is there a possibility? Is there a possibility of uh, of your simply producing an indication of where Tan Brook does run in the neighborhood? Uh, oh. That may be simply curiosity on my part, but uh, it's been mentioned a number of times. If we could just see where it runs, that would be appreciated. I happen to have it up in my screen, Tom. If you, I've got the Amherst GIS on my Tan on my screen. Tan Brook. 
I mean, we're yeah. just, yeah, you got to pan out a little bit. Yep. Yeah. A little bit more. <laughs> I like that. Uh, looks like it's right over yeah. here. So Tan Brook, and let me, so I'm going to highlight the two. This is the project site. There's Tan Brook. As the crow flies, 1,200 feet. It, it just satisfies my curiosity more than anything else. Sure. sure. Could you also look into what uh, Pam Rooney was talking about as far as the uh, the site creating this concern, please? Let me, yeah, let me look, make sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll take a look. Um, we'll have Matt and, and Phil double check it. I trust their first iteration is fine, but we'll take a closer look at it for sure. Thank you. And maybe one other one other point about um, what I think you may be interested in, Mr. Meadows. Uh, the roofs do have to be built to um, have solar, Jonathan. I guess that's probably a poor way yes. of saying it, but they have to be yeah. built the, in the order to currently requires that we we design uh, for future rooftop solar. And that's something. So we're we're talking about um, you know, what roofs there would be useful for solar. So we can't say yes, we'll have it or no. We're definitely not going to have it. The roofs are are going to be built to support it, and we're looking at it. We're actively looking at it. That, that would certainly make ground source heat pumps uh, more viable. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Other questions from members? I guess the one thing I would say is um, I would encourage you to look into some kind of um, more robust uh, way of filtering the tenants for the building than uh, the buildings than what we have. I, I understand and, and really support the notion of a diversified um, community and population amongst this. I'm, I do hear the concerns of the neighborhood about the potential for um, uh, student housing taking over, uh, dominating this, if um, indeed there's a sale of property or some other some other uh, change in ownership or management. And I would like to keep to protect from that happening. And one way to do that is through conditions that are applied to the special permit. And so I, I think it would be good to think through ways in which you can limit the number of undergrads that, that rent there, Tom. And I think that's, that's can be, a, uh, I, I know that's a, of concern and, and uh, difficult, but I think it's something that we probably need to think about some way. And um, I wonder if you could give some thought to coming back at the next meeting and, and saying, is there a number, is it 25 or 50? Uh, what is that Mr. number Chair, that would I mean, we're not going to, I'll tell you right now, we're not going to do that. That's, that's walking into a lawsuit. I mean, we're not going to put a restriction and if I don't want to be brazen, but if the board does, then there's probably going to be a lawsuit because there's you're, you're putting the applicant at risk of discrimination, discrimination claims. I mean, if, if, if there's a quota or a number that we cannot exceed, I mean, I'm not going to go down the path of positing all the different variations where it could come up, but I, I'll, I, I can appreciate, like we can come up with a, a marketing plan and we can suggest the marketing that we can do in order to avoid. But again, I'm going to back up and say it's all about management. Um, and then I'll come back in and say, we can talk about marketing. That's fine. We can talk about tenant selection. That's fine. But to have a number out there, I mean, we, we just can't agree to that. I'm sorry. And you know, I love working with, you know, I, if we can do it, we can do it. But this is just something that. Yeah, this, well, maybe a, just a, a discussion at the next meeting about that. The, the fact that the students are not a, a protected class, but there might be something is, um, is something we should ask our the town attorney to, to take a look at and then you to respond to it just so we can have a, a, um, a discussion about that. I, I, I don't want to put uh, you or your client into a bad, into a dangerous legal position. I don't want to put you into a jeopardy that way. Um, I need to understand that better though, in terms of the, um, the legal liability or the risk you face um, if, if you do that and what the risk you face as a town, if we, do, if we would do that. 
So, um, and, and I think I also, I think you're right. It does rely upon management, management, management. And while uh, I, we, we hope that the current management would live, would have a long life uh, leading this property, nothing does. And we have to figure out a way to instill that uh, permanently with the property so it goes and that's through conditions on a special permit. So we have to look at something more than just good intent and um, you know marketing. So we have some work to do over the next uh, couple of weeks to come up with something that, that works for everybody, I think. Yeah, and I don't disagree. I mean, to me, this is just like any other, it, it comes down to management. It comes down to articulation of the, con, in the conditions of the expectations of management. It's, you know, upon change of ownership, whether it's a, a, a expiration, if it's a new owner comes in and has a conversation, you know, there, there's all those tools that the Zoning Board mm -hmm. of Appeals has you know, that I think are useful in circumstances like this, because time and times change, you know, we're at this moment in time, and we're trying to say, here's how it should be for everybody in the future, which, you know, if I was myself in the future, and look back and say, you made that decision for me, what, what were you thinking? So I think we just have to be sensitive to allow reaction to the, the time and the place that people are in. And if we can set up the infrastructure through appropriate management, you know that that carries with the property and then you know if it's if it's barry or if it's somebody else it's always managed appropriately and the zoning board has the opportunity to make sure because it's a set it's an area that should be managed appropriately it is that transitional space between a higher density yeah. and a lower density and it's i mean it's it tipped one way or the other you know it could be a problem so yeah i i, I don't disagree at all with the appropriate management conditions um I'll leave it at that. Okay. Um, other comments, suggestions, do people have conditions they want to uh, discuss at this point or want to have, want to float to get reaction either from board members or the applicant? Yes, Mr. Maxfield. That's one of the things I'm considering. I don't even know if this is really anything that would come down on the applicant. I think this might be a concern of the town. But uh, just I worry about the impact it might have on the sewer system in that area. I know uh, some of our sewer systems, uh, the new buildings that had gone in across the street, um, increases the flow in there. And you're talking about areas where we might have restaurants where there's grease, things like that, getting into the sewer. What is more uh, buildings and usage of the sewer going to do to that? I'd like to get an idea of where the sewer system, how it flows, what it's going to be connected to and where it's going to uh, just in this, this property. Um, Cause I, I can, I would worry a little bit about backup depending on the flow. So I'd like to see where it's going to connect and then kind of how it, how it flows out from this building. If that's, if that's possible. Um, that's my, my yeah. major concern. That's, that's a good point. Mr. Maxfield. That's, Interesting. Yeah. So if I could, I mean, <laughs> some anticipation. So why that tree right here has to come down. So there is an old sewer line that that comes here, comes across this property, and then I think joins, you know, it might even come this way and then join over here. So sewer manhole, sewer manhole. This is going to be a brand new line uh, that that the applicant is going to pay for. Um, and the in the site. You've got sewer lines running into this new sewer manhole, and then this is additional new line, and then it continues to flow to the north um, this way. And so this is something that we've been talking about with Jason Skeels, town engineer, um, and he was in Guilford were the uh, Department of Public Works superintendent. They were the ones that asked for this new sewer line. So this is something that we're doing as part of the project. Thank you, Ms. Reedy. And the town engineer has looked at this and said it's suffi has sufficient capacity for the number of uh, residents that would be there and all that, right? Yeah. And we've got a letter from him saying we've got that. a letter from him and, and how much the fees are. Yeah, we've got all that. Yeah. Mr. Maxfield, does that answer your question? I think so. Yeah, for now, it definitely does. And you may want to talk to Jason just because I don't I don't disagree with, okay, how does the suit, like, where does it all go? 
Like what is overall, where is this all flowing to? So yeah, yeah. Jason is probably the right guy. Ms. Parks, you did have your hand up. Um, did you have something to, another question? I was just gonna make the comment that um, normally you would pay 30% of your salary for your rent or mortgage. And that if at, at $4,000 a month, you would need to make a uh, 144,000, something like that. Uh, the average UMass faculty uh, salary is 62,000. So to even two faculty, married faculty members would not be able to afford it. So I just, just making that point that uh, rents in this area are not affordable for anybody except for students at this time. I guess what I'll say is I respectfully disagree twofold. One, you don't have to only spend 30% um, plus this, you know, this includes maintenance, includes insurance, include, I mean, it, it includes other things besides just what you would consider the 30%. So maybe increase it to, to something higher and B, there are families that live in Amherst, right? It's not, it's in, in they're paying. I mean, I do closings every day and, and what they're paying for their mortgage, for the principal and interest, for their taxes. I mean, people are spending it. And I, and I don't know that a couple each making, so, okay, the average salary is 62,000. So two of them together, that's 124. You get two people maybe at the third of their career and they're making $144,000 relatively simply. And that's 30% plus they don't have maintenance. So, you know, I, I don't know that it's so disparate as you're, you're mentioning it. Um, you know, and there's, for the four bedrooms, there's 12, four bedrooms. So if there are 12 professors or, or 12 people, like we're not saying it only can be professors. There could be somebody who, who loves the proximity to the university, loves to walk down to the football stadium, loves to go to the, uh, to the basket, to, to the Mullen Center, loves to walk downtown to get a coffee, to go to the Drake. This may be a perfect place for them. You look at uh, the Hastings house. I mean, those, those are condominiums downtown and they're selling for 600 plus thousand, 650 thousand dollars because of the proximity, because of what um, the area brings. And I did a bunch of those closings. You don't necessarily even have families or you have maybe one person, but they really like it, maybe two people. So I just want to put it back into perspective because I, I, I can see the specter there, right? I've been around in this town long enough. I've been doing this long enough to know what folks are worried about. And again, it comes down to management. And I don't, I don't hear anybody saying undergrads are bad, right? Responsible undergrads are fine, uh, unruly undergrads. And, and if the tipping point goes to too many unruly undergrads, which is the fear, that's bad. So it's thinking of ways to prevent those, not saying undergrads, you can't come here um, because that's the classification that you're putting them in and saying, okay, 25%, that's it. Other, other, that's, that's because we think all undergrads are bad. I mean, what kind of message and I'm not talking to you, Ms. Parks, I'm talking generally, what kind of message are you sending? Is that this is what we think about the, the people who keep our economy going? Is that we only think 25% of you can live here uh, uh, in a society, in a community? So, you know, I, I don't think we're as far off as, as folks may think. Yes, we say 4,000, 4,500, but I showed you that that's kind of what the market is. Construction costs are incredibly high, land costs are incredibly high, labor costs is incredibly high. Housing, there is housing need. We're looking to pr propose housing here. I just don't wanna get tripped up over those things. And so I, right. I don't need to go on All a- right. on Well, I, I hear what you're <laughs> saying. I'm just saying that there's no one in my family that could afford $4,000 a month for rent. Um, my kids are all, do not live in Amherst because they can't afford the rents in Amherst. And it's, and I think it's a shame because there's not enough housing for people who need housing here. And a lot of people who are able to pay $600,000 are coming from Boston or New York City or coming from places where the salaries are a lot higher than this area. So I hear what you're saying. I'm just yeah. saying it's very hard for people who are actually from Amherst or the area to rent in this area. And actually it's very hard to buy in this area at this time. Yeah. I don't disagree. And, and bigger level, probably worth a discussion. You know, how do you get, you know, we've talked with other clients about workforce housing and 
with that is subsidies are required because if you just look at the cost of construction and the risk involved with it and how much you just need to have to cover your debt service to pay for everything that you just spent to get it done i mean that's that's really what's driving a lot of this so not not necessarily for this project but just more globally because i don't think any of us disagree right it yeah enough said well we're at nine o'clock which is uh our typical quite quitting time for a, a meeting and we can go a little bit longer if there are additional questions i just think we, we, why don't we um, why don't we uh, take an inventory of the kinds of things that we've asked for you to have? Uh, I don't think we have to go through all of that today. Uh, I've been I've been trying to write down all the requests. I know I know Maureen almost always does. Dave helps out, helps out as well. Why don't we put that together? If questions that we have um, for you to and information we need for next meeting, um, we'll get that to you the next couple of days so that you can have time to to prepare it and get it to us so we can look at it. Um, as always, it's good to have stuff seven days ahead of time. That's what we like. So we want to build some time into that. Um, and if you have, if this, if any members have additional questions, get them to Maureen directly and she can get them to the, um, to the applicant, to Tom and to Mr. Mr. Roberts. Um, I guess that what I'd like to do is uh, um, have, have this meeting go until the next time we can meet Maureen and we haven't set that date yet for the next meeting. Right. Um, yep. So I don't have a, I can't um, suspend the meeting or it's until the, a date certain, public. a continuum it's meeting to a date certain yet. So let's leave the public hearing open until we can set that date. Um, um, I, so how do, how do in we this do process, that? <laughs> we, would, we need to, we need to continue. Well, uh, you know, we hope that the applicant is agreeable to continuing the public hearing to a date and time certain, and we need to figure that that out right now before we okay. end tonight's meeting. So, uh, right, so, Mr. Judge is not available on May the twelfth, which is right. our normal um, our our next regularly scheduled meeting. Um, so, um, you know, if you know, a possible date is is not meeting until the fourth Thursday of the month, which would be May the twenty sixth. Or would folks with with the applicant and the it with the applicant and the ZBA members be um, flexible in in meeting on a um, on a special um, evening, um, perhaps sometime between the sixteenth and the nineteenth? Fine by us. Okay. Uh, what what do folks? What is EBA members? I could do the sixteenth, seventeenth, eighteenth, or the twenty sixth. Okay. And just eighteenth is not good on my end because I've there, you have planning board and historical commission, and I have a hearing somewhere else at the same time. So, D Dylan, when do you have a licensing commission meeting? Or do, uh, does that have are, any impact? Uh, the, we're, we're Monday nights, but um. Right now, the only thing I can can definitely plan in advance of would have to be on a Thursday. Um, that you could you could meet on Thursday. Any 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 Thursday, Thursday. next month. Okay. Let's... Um. Let's see here. Oh oh, the nineteenth. Uh, it looks like Steve is not available on the nineteenth. Well, that may that may change, but right now I'm not available, um, and I'm trying to move that, but I'm I don't know that I can. Okay. Marine, I am unavailable on the nineteenth of May. Okay. And what's today's the 20 okay so okay may 5th is not an option um too and, soon um did anyone say the 16th would work monday the 16th it would work for me but i thought dylan said he couldn't work. do it sorry i okay i guess okay sorry i i can't keep up with all this um this uh, can we just go uh date by date sorry i i, I know dylan you indicated yep. but i i didn't jot it down. Okay, let's say Tuesday the seventeenth. Would that work, Marie? That entire week for me uh, does not work. Okay, so uh, Monday. It, it kind of looks like uh, May the twenty sixth might be. Yep, that looks like that's the date. That looks like that's the date. Make it happen. Okay. Well, that was easy. Okay. 
So, and that would be May the 26th at six o'clock via Zoom. All right, so um, if that's good with the client, right? I know you'd prefer it sooner. But oh yeah, no, I, I mean, I've got another hearing that night, so I'm just trying to think of what I'm oh, gonna yeah, do. Sorry. I mean, it's more important that the board all gets together. I don't know if you have, um, cause I've got a hearing in Ludlow that night. If any other day that week works, like the 25th or the 24th, I'm free. So Tuesday, the 24th no. or Wednesday, the 25th. Looks like Craig says no. And then, so I guess Monday the 23rd yeah. is the only other one. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So then we'll, I'll figure something out for Thursday, the 26th. All right, yeah, is the there time a time that would be better for you? No, uh, four o'clock in the afternoon, three o'clock in the afternoon. I, I don't know. I don't works for me. Uh, would that work for uh, Tammy? You, you work until no, that Tammy works, work. okay. right? You're in the what day is that? The twenty sixth, the Thursday, the twenty sixth. Any chance you could meet earlier than six o'clock on that Thursday? Uh, no, no. Okay, I can't do that. No, yeah. no, that's good. Okay, that's fine. I can do any other day, <laughs> not the 24th or 26th. So then um, I move that we continue the public hearing until on this matter until the 26th at six o'clock via Zoom. Do I have a second? Go ahead, Maureen. Do, no, do, no, need no, to no, anything else? Yep. do I have a second? Second. Second. Mr. Maxfield. Um, any discussion? If not, uh, roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks? Aye. Mr. Maxfield? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Gilbert? Aye. Motion carries. So we will continue this on the 26th. The end of month. Okay. Thank you very yeah. much. Thank you. Um, next order of business is any pub is public comment on any matter before, except for the matter before the body tonight. So um, anybody in any matter at all, just not um, on this application. I don't see any hands raised. I see no hands raised. No. And lastly, um, any business that came up uh, in the last 48 hours that was not previously anticipated I don't think no. we just dealt with it, <laughs> which was how to schedule the next meeting. Oh, well, there uh, you go. So that, that was, we, we've taken care of it. All right. So um, we'll work together, Maureen, to, to put together a list of questions and information that we need from the, the applicant. Um, if you have any other questions, get it to Maureen over the next couple of days. We'd like to try to move as, as quickly as possible to get that information to them so they can get it back to us. And we're not looking at stuff at the last minute because that's always the it works to our disadvantage and to the as well as to the applicants disadvantage because we don't understand it all right um are there anything else anybody wants to bring up mr maxfield yeah, i actually got one i was looking at um the memorandum sent around and we do have in here a uh position for vice chair that i don't think we have filled at all i didn't know if uh any guys wanted to uh wanted to go over that at all do you want to talk about that or no in here i thought i thought go ahead marina but i thought we had a vice chair uh vice you know i think dylan does bring up an excellent point i think okay. in the i think the last time when we voted for the chair for steve it was uh a lot of things were going on uh with covid and i think we might have had a oops and didn't do that um but we, um, oh so from when memory serves me um so traditionally at the end of each fiscal year so the end of june all municipal boards should be um doing a vote for their reorganization and it is part of the zba rules and regulations to um to vote in the chairperson and the vice chair mm -hmm. and I, I don't know if the zba needs a clerk I don't know if that's, I don't know what that person would do, but um, but we can certainly, uh, and we need to officially add it to an agenda. So um, mm -hmm. 
I guess because um, I'll I can take a look at uh, at the rules and regs to see if we could just do it at the next meeting or if we should just wait until July. I'm not I'm not completely sure on that. But it sounds like Dylan might want to be a vice chair. Is that well potentially, but something an idea that I'd be uh, kind of posing to the board here of um, for something we could do with vice chair. I don't think it says anything that it has to be a year long term. I uh, I imagine we all might like a shot of uh, vice chair while we're serving on this board. Something to think about. Maybe if we were to set up something like three month terms for vice chair. That way we can kind of rotate that position in, people can get in, people can have the experience of chairing anytime, you know, Steve is out, something like that. And then, uh, you know, something I remember learning from, uh, you know, my days doing political organizing back in the day, uh, titles are free, don't cost anybody anything, we can all get that nice, oh, you know, <laughs> vice chair on the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals, yeah. I'll put that on our resume there, I'll get that yeah. shot to do so. But yeah, so I, are I, you talking about maybe being like a co-chair or like um no just just the position that's but, in here is vice chair okay. of serving you know with if steve is uh unable to serve as gotcha. chair. yeah okay yep still just filling I that think, role i think we should um make sure we elect the leadership we should follow that um something that we should do each year we're gonna have to that's coming up because our terms some people's terms are ending um and the town council hasn't started the fill the process of filling the board seats yet so it makes sense first of all it makes sense to fill any vacancies if we don't have it and i thought tammy was vice chair i thought that oh, was established that is... before but that's my memory but we could check the check the minutes do you remember that i thought when i was chairman we just picked the next most senior person and that was uh, in seniority on service and that was tammy but if that's not the case then we should fill that position and and have it and we can uh, do that and we and we should have that at an announced meeting where it's on the agenda and um and it's a, it's a matter to be discussed and then i think we should when the um new members or at any time the committee wants to decide on chairmanship and other leadership positions it can do it but I, it seems to me it makes sense that once the town just um identifies who's going to serve on the on the zba going forward that you then sit down and decide who's the next chair and vice chair going forward for the next year is what i'm thinking so let's get a vice chair if we don't already have one and then when then when we decide on the member when the town council decides on the membership because my my um term is up in june i think and i don't know if they'll reappoint me Mr. Gilbert's term is up in June, I think. Yeah, I think Mr. Gilbert's right. term is up. Uh, Dylan, Craig, and Tammy's your your terms are not up yet, so you're going to be on the board for sure. So it doesn't make it seems to me it makes sense to elect a new chairman and a new slate of officers once you have the new membership. That's all I'm saying. And that will be start no later June. than July first. Yeah but fill whatever vacancies we have fill a fill a clerkship if that's a, a title that people want sure yeah. all right yeah well and i just uh, think we um, do it on the 26th okay sounds good does that make sense okay i i happily defer to anyone else who would like to be the vice chair My, <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I i have enough on but, my plate at the moment so we can hash it out at, uh, at the at the next meeting when there needs to be a vote, and and right. you can make your okay. your your uh, your speech, <laughs> your campaign speeches. I don't want to please do choose someone else. <laughs> yeah. If, if nominated, I will not run. If elected, I will not serve. Is that are you are you Sherman <laughs> Esk on this time? <laughs> That's it. All right. Yep. But I I really did think we had a that you had that position. So uh, if not, let's um, let's select one next meeting and the uh, next in May yeah. 26th. Yep. All right. I'll add that to the agenda. Good catch. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Dylan. Dylan. All right. Um, is there any other business? Any more? Nope. No, this is the, right. the motion, motion to adjourn. So move. There's a second. Okay. All right. Motion seconded. This is not debatable. Uh, chair votes aye.
Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. All right. It's unanimous. We're done. Thanks, everyone. All right. Thank you all. Good night. See you guys. Thank you.